This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweet. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney, Michael Barr on assignment. Is he scheduled for Monday? I think Is so. Is that a sighting so. on Monday? Exactly. He's up we in Napa so. now this weekend. Yeah, Lisa Mateo with us as well, and uh, John Tucker helping out this morning. We welcome you for three hours of festivities. Friday, slide into an almost summer, perfect weather weekend. Not. Things changed, and we're going to talk about it here in a moment. Uh, the whole Fed Watch thing for next week, September 18th, radically changed in the last 12 hours. That'll be our lead feel here today. It folds into equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, maybe even folds into the election. Futures up 13, Dow futures up 81, NASDAQ on a percentage basis, not so good. But the VIX under 17, 16.86 shows it as all. Well. Paul, what are you looking at on the screen this morning besides the 30-year mortgage? Exactly right. The two-year Treasury uh, off about five basis points here, Tom. The two years down to three point. Five eight yeah. percent. It wasn't that long ago that we were looking at five percent on a two year treasury. That I mean that you could build a career on five percent. We're now down to three point five eight percent. Yen made a dash to a stronger yen, 140 down to 139, a richer, oh, yeah. stronger yen. Yeah. Didn't get there, wow. but uh, that's something to watch as well. Just a whole lot going on. We welcome you on YouTube after your commute. Consider YouTube in your living room, at your <laughs> office, maybe both. Uh, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts. That's the best way to do it on YouTube. Good morning, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto. Along the corridor, 99.1 FM Washington. Radio Hager, we're calling it yep, now. Okay. Radio Very Nathan good. Hager. Player. They won an award last night. Did Bloomberg they? Daybreak. Yeah, wow. we don't win awards. No, we don't win them. Hager, Moscow. They won some, you know. They're professionals or, down there in Washington. Or, or, or whatever. Good morning, our flagship. Bloomberg 1130 in beautiful New York City. In Boston, 92. Uh, 9 FM, good morning. From the Interactive Broker Studios, our Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. Good morning. Yeah, futures trying to keep up that momentum from yesterday's gains. Right now we have NASDAQ futures up about a tenth of a percent, 17 points. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, 77 points. S&P futures up two tenths of a percent, or 12 points. The two-year yield at 3.59 percent, down four basis points. The yield on the 10-year, 3.65 percent. That's down two basis points. To commodities, we have spot gold higher, $2,566 an ounce. We have Brent crude, $72 a barrel. WTI crude, $69 a barrel. Shares of Boeing down 3%. Its factory workers started their first walkout in 16 years. Then we go to American Airlines. Flight attendants approved a contract that will raise wages as much as 20%, increase pay and benefits by $4.2 billion over five years. American Airlines up about half a percent. Meanwhile, Southwest Airlines flight attendants, well, they got the green light from a federal judge. They're going to move forward in a class action. Claims that their attendance policy change punishes workers who take medical and family leave. Southwest up about two tenths of percent. And since we're talking airlines, United Airlines, they say a day of investor uh, updates. It was originally scheduled for May, now likely to be put off until the spring of 2025. Well, shares down two tenths of a percent. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Dan Scully with us right now. Uh, working on strategy, working on research with Morgan Stanley's wealth management team. Yep. Dan, I, I think bond bond types are in a conundrum. I'm bringing up here the Bloomberg Total Return Index. It's a huge, beautiful summary of uh, everything out there. And, and Dan, I'm looking on a price basis, a blended bond index is off the April lows, a capital gain of 8%, a total return. Is there a point where you get out of fixed income with a gain like that? Good morning, Tom. So you're definitely right in noting this massive move in bonds since the spring. We've come very far, very fast. Uh, we had been advocating from a investment committee and from a Morgan Stanley macro level, uh, owning some of the higher quality parts of the bond market. And look, we would say bonds today are more of a hold. We certainly have uh, more question marks related to the outlook in the next six months. They're no longer a screaming buy that they were six months ago. 
Um, but they're, they're more of a hold today for sure. So, Dan, it looks like we've got a Federal Reserve that's about to begin cutting interest rates. And we're not sure to what what the cadence will be, the duration of this cuts, and the absolute magnitude of the cuts. All that being said, how are you guys thinking about portfolio construction in a declining interest rate environment? Good morning, Paul. So, look, I think this is yet another wall of worry, a wall of question marks that the markets need to climb in the coming months. Um, let's face it, you know, stepping back and thinking about the context of this particular cycle uh, since COVID, since the Fed started raising rates two years ago, a, a lot of nuance and a lot of uh, idiosyncratic uh, niche ideas have really been uh, percolating in the economy, given all the distortion that COVID created. So I, I don't actually find it that surprising that this is yet another uncertainty uh, that the market's grappling with. To your question in terms of how do you think about portfolio construction, uh, bonds are still a meaningful part of our allocation. Along the equity spectrum, we think the rotation that you saw starting in the in the middle of the summer continues with more tech performance drifting to a broader equal weight and value leadership. Uh, and so those are some of the key considerations. Hey, Dan, I'm just reading through your notes here, and, and you say that we believe that investors should overweight low vol, dividend yield, and quality value. What does that mean? Like, what where does that take you then? Yeah, excellent question, Paul. So if you think about those different factors, particularly in the first half of the year, they were truly out of favor. Uh, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, they've certainly been starting to make a comeback uh, in the last, call it, two months. So starting with low vol, right, that takes you to sectors like staples, like healthcare, uh, like utilities. And utilities, as you know, has had this additional boost from the powering AI uh, intersection yep. as well. Uh, in terms of quality value, Paul, the genesis behind that call is we don't want to just buy cheap stocks or cheapness in and of itself, because the reality is in the event that you have a more soft landing vis-a-vis -vis a shallow and uh, steady rate cutting cycle, your endpoint on rates is still going to be vastly higher than it was post-08. And so you still need quality cash flows. You still need enduring pricing. Uh, so the idea is to take an extra fundamental layer to your value stock selection. All right, Dan. So it's interesting here. I mean, a, a lot of folks are just saying, I don't know what to do vis-a-vis -vis the magnificent seven names versus the rest of the market. Do I need to try to get a little smarter and find value out there? Or can I just be, I'm not going to say lazy, but can I be a little bit complacent and just stick with those big tech names? Yeah, this is a really important question, Paul. So if you go back 18 months ago, you had to have made a big overweight call on the Magnificent Seven, just given how concentrated that leadership was. And, you know, everyone gave them grief about 99 bubble comparisons, but let's face it, they had all the magnificent earnings uh, in the market. Now you're seeing earnings broaden out. So the Magnificent Seven in tech is a third of the market you really need to treat it with okay. a risk lens, right? You, I think it's very right. difficult, frankly, to make big underweight yeah. calls or, or exit calls. So it's likely more of an equal weight position today. Dan, I want you to talk to Morgan Stanley Wealth Management clients right now. We've had, a, a, Paul, you were here. I took one day off this summer, folks, and the yep. VIX went oh to my 60. Gosh. I literally, yeah. I kid you not. Can't uh, do that again. You know, I said, Lisa, take my vacation days. Paul, take my vacation days. So August, Dan, the world blows up. September, Dan, the world blows up. Everybody's heads are spinning. I had maximum gloom last weekend. You know I'm going to get gloom from the gloom crew this Friday. How do people that want to invest see in this three-day bull market we've got, how do they process the gloom that's swirling in front of them each and every day. Tom, I'm about to send you a care package hearing that recap of the summer, but you're right. When you look at what happened over the July, August months, Dan, not so relaxing. Dan, I can't take a 1.75. Okay, it's gotta be a smaller bottle. Okay, continue. <laughs> Tom, not so relaxing summers uh, abound for everyone between Yen carry unwind, uh, jobs revisions, a little bit of the steam coming out of AI. The, the technical and some of these fundamental updates took the markets down the elevator, 
But I think more conviction around the soft landing yeah. has taken the market back up the elevator. And look, we're hearing yeah. just this week yes. from Morgan Stanley's industrial okay. conference for hosting over 200 companies in California right. that the industrial economy re remains resilient. So, Tom, to conclude, it's a 3% unsustainable trend from right. last year going closer to a 2% okay. trend. Dan, we got to run breaking news. Dan Skelly, Morgan Stanley, thank you so much. Here's what's happened the last 24 hours away from economics. We've had Ed Hyman, Paul, in with us, what, three days ago, sure. four yep. days ago? He capitulated with his team. He said, we don't believe in a hard landing anymore. We have shifted to a soft landing, a non-recession, constructive market. In the last 20 minutes, Michael Purvis has published with Tallbacken, and he's made real clear he doesn't see the agony out there. He has raised his SPX call. We are parentheses, only Purvis uses parentheses, <laughs> belatedly raising our year end target 4,800 to 5,800. Joining us now in his early morning, Michael Purvis of Tallback. And Michael, what changed to get you to gap up 1,000 points? Well, Tom, actually, when I wrote that 4,800 from last December, I was really pretty constructive at the yes, time. Yes, you were. A little, I was being a little bit cautious, and I've been very bullish through the year. The belatedly comment was because I, you know, with all the August volatility, I was just, uh, it wasn't a, 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 a change of heart or view. It was simply uh, getting around to uh, getting the upgrade out, right. if you will. So I, it, it was a bit of a mark to market. Okay. But the, the important thing here is, is that, is that look? I, I uh, I've never been in the hard landing camp. I believe we're in a shift to a higher right. nominal GDP environment, which is going to be pretty right. constructive for earnings. Um, and the other point that I'm I'm really stressing here is is that don't buy if you're bullish on equities, you've got to be bullish on big cash. Well, that's where I want right? to go. Okay, but Michael, this is important. Lisa Mateo has two kids ordering their iPhone 16 Pro Max whenever this bell switches. There's a sentence in the Purvis note, Michael, I got one minute. Big yeah. tech will keep driving the bus. Discuss. Well, what that means is that the earnings growth uh, from the big tech, call it MAG6, MAG7, uh, whatever you want, um, that earnings growth is very superior, but in addition, and superior not just in terms of the quantity, but also in terms of the stability and the predictability. NVIDIA is a little bit of a footnote there. Yeah. The second thing is that if you look at the price earnings to growth ratios, right? In other words, yeah, sure, PEs are higher for big tech, but if you look at them adjusted for growth, they're less than half what they are for the uh, what we call the everything else of the market. In this case, I'm using the SPX equal weight as a proxy right. there, right? So it's, it's so so it's actually a very reasonably priced right. uh, growth um, uh, there. Sometimes it gets overextended, certainly there. But uh, right. if you really think that the rotation is going to be where you want to stay right. for the next six to twelve months. You, you're going to be with a much uh, a okay. smaller equity rally. Michael, you're a trooper. I mean, he's up there. The leaves have already changed. He's up with Henry Fonda, Jane Fonda, Squam Lake. You know, they're like doing the whole New Hampshire thing. The leaves have changed in that. Michael Purvis, too early in the New Hampshire morning. Thank you so much. Mr. Purvis goes from 4,800 up to 5,800 on an SPX call. And we saw Ed Hyman's team at Evercore ISI with a more optimistic uh, tone. Uh, well, you know, we got Anurag on later. I mean, you know, is, is Tucker ordering a new iPhone today? No, of course not, please. No, you know. Existing one works just fine. Fine. It's been yeah. there for, for 10 years. We're comfortable. Features up 10. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And this Bloomberg Business Flash brought to you by Interactive Brokers Portfolio, Portfolio Analysts. Consolidate and analyze all your financial accounts on one powerful dashboard for free. Sign up for a Portfolio Analyst at ibkr.com slash free PA. All right, futures are in the green. Fresh U.S. data kept investors guessing on the size of an expected rate cut from the Federal Reserve. Former Fed official Bill Dudley said there's, quote, a strong case for a 50 basis point cut next week. Today, more economic data. We have a read on import prices for August at 8.30 Wall Street time. And sentiment comes in after the open. So we have Nasdaq futures, little change, up about half a point. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, 49 points. S&P futures up a tenth of a percent, or eight points. The two-year yield at 3.59%, down five basis points. A yield on the 10-year, 3.65%, down two basis points. To earnings we go. Adobe down 8% after its revenue forecast failed to reflect an AI uplift. But on the flip side, you have Oracle up 6%. Investors cheered its long-term sales targets. And finally, OpenAI. It's released a new AI model. It can perform some human-like reasoning tasks. Should be able to solve multi-step problems like complicated math and coding questions. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> We're on demand news 24 hours a day. Subscribe to Bloomberg News want... now, wherever you get your podcast. That's a Bloomberg business. Can podcast. we have some AI chat GPT that can get a 17-year-old to empty the dishwasher? That's <laughs> I all I want. Wish. Exactly. It didn't happen yesterday. Oh. I'm looking for artificial intelligence. <laughs> Empty the dishwasher. Eight excuses. Uh, why not? Future's up nine right now. Really, really interesting Friday, uh, folks. And, of course, the litmus paper of the system, the deepest part of the system, is our foreign exchange. Jow are churning a little bit stronger over the last number of days. But yen almost to a 139 today. Joining us now from Barclays, uh, London, the pride of St. Andrews. Do you know how many kids are applying to St. Andrews this I year? Know. A lot of American kids go Skyler there. Skylar Montgomery Cunning went there. They're like, we got to go there. Oh, we yeah, what Canadians. was that other couple that went there? Prince and Duchess oh, of that. That's right, yep. Joining us now, uh, Duchess Montgomery Cunning of Barclays as well at Ford Exchange. Skylar, were you there at St. Andrews when they were there? No, I wasn't. Um, you know, maybe telling to my age or not, but I came after them. You came <laughs> after them, okay. But you went to the coffee shop, the red coffee shop, where they said this is the first place. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I mean, like... which one? There are several that they say are the first place. Okay, <laughs> very good. There are also several reasons why we're calling for dollar weakness. Is Barclay on the idea of dollar weakness due to Fed cuts? Yeah, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, mostly, essentially, we're actually more cautious near term, but we're more bullish longer term. So FX, what you've seen, essentially, it's only been trading the Fed easing cycle with more dovishness seen as a detriment to the dollar. And as the market figures out the extent of the economic weakness in the U.S., you could potentially see more dovishness priced in, and that definitely would weigh on the dollar. But the room seems very limited if you think we're heading for a soft landing, right? So the market already prices a terminal rate below 3%. If we were to price significantly lower than that, it implies that the Fed is easing and a hard landing, which the dollar would likely gain on from safe haven flows. And historically, what you actually see is that on average, the dollar does weaken into the first cut of the cycle. But the depreciation we've already seen is larger than the historical averages. And post the first cut, the dollar tends to gain as the market realizes the growth scare is a scare. And the other consistent theme, which I think is important, is that across past soft landings, the market overprices the amount of easing that is eventually delivered. So when that overpriced easing comes out, the dollar should rally. But certainly in the near term, there are still downside risks there. So, uh, Skyler, one of the things Thomas is mentioning, uh, the yen here uh, strengthening today to down to 140 spot seven. What's going on with the yen? What is the Barclays call on the Japanese yen? Yeah, sure. So the yen has been bid lately on risk aversion. And if we do get a recession, I would expect the yen to rally versus the dollar. And I'd actually expect it to be, you know, broadly an outperformer overall. But that's not our base case. And I also don't think it's the markets. I don't think um, quite a lot of consensus or even market pricing indicates a recession outcome. And we think a large portion of short term yen carry trades have been unwound. So dollar yen now looks more in line with rate differentials. It makes the scope for further yen strength limited. And our dollar forecast or dollar yen forecast is for 
to rise into 2025. But there's no doubt that the Bank of Japan has made a hawkish turn. So we like yen, but on the crosses, one example being versus Swiss, just uh, given yeah, our dollar Tom's view, it's a, it's a little bit more tenuous yeah. there. Paul, moments ago, Tor- Torsten Slock playing off Skyler Montgomery Koenig. Torsten Slock saying <laughs> foreign demand for U.S. credit. Here's the key phrase near all time wow. highs. Uh, yeah. Dr. Slock at Apollo. Yeah, very interesting. So it, it's interesting, Skyler. So if, if the dollar's maybe got a little bit of weakness near term, but longer term, not so much, where, where do you find value in the currency markets today? Is there any trade that kind of jumps out at you? Yeah, absolutely. So as I kind of alluded to, we really like being short Swiss versus yen. That's carry efficient. It's a hard landing hedge. And I also think the risk reward is attractive. I mean, as I said, the Bank of Japan is clearly on a hawkish path relative to the rest of G10. And we actually have a more hawkish forecast for them than consensus as well as the market. And we've had these rounds of appreciation in recent weeks on the growth scares out of the U.S. On the other hand, Swiss is too strong. Inflation is quite low in Switzerland. The S&P well, has a bias for a weaker currency, and they worry about export competitiveness. And I think you know the next step, if they can't get the currency right. down with interest rate cuts, is intervention. Well, they are, and Scott, let me dovetail like four emotions here, starting with Swiss franc <laughs> and the idea of deflation or disinflation. There's a small matter of China. I got Torsten Slack saying demand for U.S. credit is near all-time highs. At Barclays, are you looking at a rate study or are you looking at a flow study into 2025? In terms of China or in terms of the outlook? Everything, there? everything. Off, yeah. the Barclays okay. desk, <laughs> off the Barclays desk in London, which is just like they do it at a Starbucks <laughs> over there. But, but, but Ty, Skyler, to me, the whole question is, is it about big money flows coming up okay. or is it about rate differentials? Yeah, I think we're largely thinking about it being rate differentials. I mean, if you think about the U.S., you've had a strong dollar because you've had these large inflows, but they're kind of stuck, right? The U.S. has been outperforming, and you've had these inflows because U.S. equities, U.S. markets generally have outperformed the rest of the world, and I don't think that changes, so that flow doesn't right. change. The interest rate differential is what we think needs to change. I think there's too much dovishness priced in the U.S., and when that right. comes out, you'll see some dollar strength. Skyler Montgomery Cunning, thank you so much to Barclays. When you do your first junk at the New York uh, City for the shop, Skyler, darken the door here. We'd love to see you in our world uh, headquarters this morning. I'm going to get you the exact time, folks. The, the, the great thing about what Paul and I see, like somebody goes, did you get my email? And I'm like, are you kidding me? There's like 10,000. <laughs> And the answer is this morning, uh, I can tell you exactly, it's 600 Anna Wong and oh, okay. uh, uh, Estelle O published, and they said really clear CPI and PPI lead you to a September 27th core PCE deflator where 50 basis points is back in play. Really? The meeting is before September 27th. My people said I have to, the Fed decides. I didn't yep. know, it's September 18th we're doing that. And the answer, folks, is you say, how did we get to this frenzy of bull market tone in the last two days? It is about earnings, Paul. It's yep. a Gina Martin Adams, Cam Dawson, double digit earnings. But what it's really about is a legit study of a 50 basis point cut. I would not have said that 48 hours ago. No, I would not. I mean, I kind of thought that the uh, some of the recent economic data that we had kind of took 50 off the table. But, I mean, you know, a lot of folks that think long-term, Barry Ritholtz, for example, that thinks long-term says, don't worry about 25 or 50 basis points. The fact is the Fed is in an easing cycle. Rates are coming down. Right. That is kind of going to inform your, your, your argument. And quite frankly, uh, on September 27th, I'm going to be in Limerick, Ireland. I could care less what happens. Yeah, and your airfare was cheaper than it, it would was, have been a year exactly. ago. Exactly. Very, you're very true, Tom. Anna Wong, PPI airfare prices is something they're okay. looking at. Business inflation, airfare prices are lower, so that's why Sweeney's going home to the motherland. <laughs> is, well, how do you get to Limerick from Dublin? We go Dublin up to Belfast, over to Kerry, and then come down the western coast of Ireland. So we're doing the whole thing. You could do Ireland in like 15 minutes. It's like Wisconsin. That, that, that's kind of what I feel. Did you look at the real estate prices in Dublin? No. They're like the most expensive they in the really? world. Yeah, well, yeah. Right. They're insane. I, are you going there for the weather? I mean, what are you doing? I, so you're I in mean, a, I love Ireland. When do I, I get a life? When do I go to Ireland? <laughs>
Bloomberg Surveillance, Coast to Coast. Good morning on YouTube. Breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures in the green. This is as investors place their bets on the size of rate cuts from the Fed next week. According to economists surveyed by Bloomberg News, policymakers likely to lower interest rates by a quarter point next week at each of the two meetings that follow. Right now we have NASDAQ futures, little change up about 12 points. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, 63 points. S&P futures up two tenths of a percent or 11 points. We have the two-year yield at 3.59 percent, down four basis points. A yield on the 10-year, 3.65 percent, and that's down two basis points. To currencies, the dollar weaker. Japanese yen up seven tenths of a percent at 140.80 against the dollar. The euro stronger. British pound weaker. We have Bitcoin 
down uh, at about 50, 58,000. Companies making news, that would be Amazon. It plans to spend an additional $2.1 billion on its contract delivery unit. That includes safety programs, training, also pay raised to almost $22 an hour. Amazon shares little change. And 4,800 people working at Verizon, well, they took up the company's offer to walk away in exchange for a severance package, and that's going to cost Verizon about $1.9 billion. Their shares little change. And Cox Communications cutting hundreds of workers, about 5% of its staff, revenue, and cable TV phone service declines. That is a Bloomberg business flash, Tom and Paul. Let's do that right now quickly, Paul. I, I mean, now is the time. They've got to start right-sizing this yeah. media debacle. And Cox Communications, a privately held company. Who, who are they? The Explain Cox family. Uh, Cox family has been in uh, media uh, for uh, really more than a century, uh, radio, television, magazines, cable television, satellites, uh, privately held company. I've tried to take them public a million times. I took their radio company public, Cox Radio, back in the day. They, they, they were good. Um, but again, they're, you're right, Tom. They're in a business that's just seen this incredible uh, yeah. change. People are just cutting the cord in, on, on their cable. I, I, I look at streaming, and it's the most confusing thing I've ever seen now. Yeah. I can get this on Apple, that I on Apple. I just cut I everything. I, recently, I just went yeah. into my little phone thing. I just nuked everything, yeah. except for Netflix. Let us continue the discussion here. This is not a normal Friday. It is perfect weather in New York City. Good morning, Bloomberg 1130 AM in uh, New York. Sweeney's here on a Friday, which is extraordinary. I was yeah, shocked not, when I came not good. in uh, this morning. Futures up 12, the VIX 16.90. We need to piece it together. At Moneta Group is Ethan Devitt. She is absolutely extraordinary. Coming off, she's hung over from a 40th birthday party thing. Oh, okay. I think she tipped 39 or 40, Very and she's good. with us uh, this morning. Even happy birthday, congratulations, and, and all that. You have such a holistic background, and of course, from the venue of Ireland and London is different than America. Ethan, are we beyond the pandemic? What, in terms of our... Um and recovery from economic uh, economic conditions. Economics, the pandemic, society, much. debt buildup. I mean, are, is it a great misjudgment that we're back to normal and back to prosperity? We're not back to normal yet. As long as we are still spending excess savings, and that's what's happening in the U.S. And I should thank you as they were I'm actually my 40th last night, but I'm going to take an extra decade if you're, if you're willing to give <laughs> it to okay. me. It's okay. We do um, that here. We do that at surveillance. The charm is alive and well. Um, but yes, as long as the excess spending is still there and is being spent down, which we're still seeing because we know that the U.S. consumer is living beyond their means. So it must be coming out of savings or more consumer credit. As long as that is there, we, we still have the hangover. The pandemic hangover is also a belief that when lower rates go low, they go very low and they stay low for long. Even though we know statistically that's very unlikely to happen, there is still a belief that easing is coming. And yeah. as you know, until this 25 basis point cut, it looked like it was even going to be 50 basis points. That's what people expected. When you look at your view on America, when you look at the growth estimates from Lagarde and the ECB, can you write a research piece this weekend on moderate or genuine stagflation? It's interesting. I don't see the inflation part of the stagflation. I do see stagnation, though. And certainly within Europe, there is very little in terms of green shoots. We don't have that same innovation and technology push that we've seen in the US. The inflation, though, I think is fairly confidently in retreat in Europe as it is around the world. There could be spikes. There could be service level spikes. We could see some spikes in energy if we enter a winter where we have energy shortages or issues like that. But I don't see the inflation part as really kicking us off. The stagnation part, though, that's concerning. Growth is quite anemic, and we haven't had that hard landing. So therefore, there could be these cracks that will start turning into fissures and ultimately will undermine some of these corporates who just can't keep ends, make ends meet or keep things together. So, Ethan, you know, given your global strategist remit here, where do you see the kind of the best opportunities here as, as you talk to your clients these days? It's interesting. As a global strategist, I would obviously be always biased towards a global approach, but that has been an increasingly difficult position to defend recently as the UK has been the juggernaut, the engine of market growth and continues to hold that position. I would say that it is important, though, to maintain the global exposure simply because the um, history would suggest that there is a reversion to the mean, that there are these pockets of growth that are perhaps being underpriced by markets. 
And you do, do get that benefit of the currency differential when we see a weaker dollar as we have today. And we know that areas like Japan can have these breakout rallies, which will reflect fundamentals, but can come from nowhere. And you want to be well diversified so that you're in a position to take advantage of that. I will say that with the US election, that is really dominating all outlooks at the moment, because this is not just a domestic election. This is an election that will have serious implications for trading partners around the world, particularly China and Europe. So in a way, this cloud of uncertainty that is sitting around many US investors today has already, I think, contaminated other investors around the world. And I think for the next 60 odd days, there will be a hesitance around putting on um, risk positions because we just don't know which way this will go. So, I mean, I, I guess one of the questions here for a lot of folks is, you know, stocks, bonds, and, you know, the 60-40 portfolio, and we've actually had some positive returns this year in fixed income. So how do you think about fixed income in, in a portfolio these days in terms of weightings? It's interesting. We say, would you start from here? And if you were to start from here in fixed income, you're getting a very decent yield. We know the direction of rates is likely to be downwards, and that will be a nice tailwind for fixed income. As far as how much to allocate to fixed income, income this is varied around right about the time when rates were close to zero it was really there as a ballast as a deflation hedge in institutional portfolios it was as low as five percent it wasn't at 40 percent very rare even among private wealth clients to see fixed income at 40 percent we had 80 year old clients that were quite keen to have 80 percent in equities they did not reflect the typical profile what would i put in fixed income today probably about 15 percent 20 percent yes the yield is attractive but you have to capture growth and you're not going to get growth in a fixed income environment. Right. Um, ultimately, we, we don't see the major upside right. in bonds, but it is an important source of income. And as I said, that's right. inflation. Hey, Finn, one final question. I've got to go to you on this. I went to the Irish Times to get really, really good perspective on Apple owing $13 kajillion to the EU. I guess it's escrowed in bonds right now. I guess it's a drop in the bucket for Apple in that. What is the ramification for the people of Ireland from a new tax policy required in the nation versus the other EU countries? Well, first, let's talk about that Apple windfall, if it is one. Um, yes, you said a drop in the ocean for Apple, but would it be a major windfall and could be the, the source of a sovereign wealth fund in Ireland? It could be used in, in a way that would benefit generations to come. So certainly very impactful in that way. Yes, Ireland has benefited from its tax policy. Um, if there was more of a normalization versus other EU, there may not be the att attractiveness relative terms of, of it as a base. But Ireland, and I'm a product of this, has an excellent education system, a highly educated workforce, and it is very commercial in how it attracts multinationals. So I think that even if the tax system is tweaked, that ecosystem is going to remain extremely <coughs> attractive on the edge of Europe there. Ethan, thank you so much. Ethan Devitt with yeah. us, with Moneta, just fabulous, really giant holistic perspective as well. Peter, thank you so much for listening. Got a lovely uh, note here from Peter. Paul, this time of year, just now beginning, the drive from Medfield, Massachusetts to Wellesley, yeah. you go through Dover, okay. is like a movie set. Yeah, There's no other way uh, to put it. It is an extraordinary drive for the woods central New England, thank you, I should say central Boston, uh, up Center Street, then Central Avenue, mm -hmm. and then the Charles, you go along the Charles River there. Okay. Uh, it, it's just a really extraordinary way to get into Boston from Medfield South, north, through Dover uh, to Wellesley. We say good morning to all of you, including Peter on 92.9 FM. Right. We, just the first results we have from this experiment across all of New England with the huge signal of 92.9 FM has been very gratifying. We say again, good morning to all of you there. When you get to the office, consider Paul Sweeney and Lisa Mateo on YouTube. You subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts on YouTube, Easy. growing and building every day. Mrs. Keene was watching YouTube and said, John Tucker just looks so good. Oh, fantastic. Tanned and rested. I know where you're going with this. And don't just, get involved because I'm not interested. <laughs> I can just, I can feel that she's trying to set me up. Mrs. I can feel Keen it. would do that? Yeah. Yes, she would. <laughs> yes, you're right. I'm yeah. not a willing participant. With our news in New York City, I'm not willing to participate, John Tucker. It's all a big conspiracy. Anyway, uh, we're leading off with this story. For the first time in 16 years, factory workers have walked off the job at Boeing.
Members of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers representing 33,000 Boeing employees across the West Coast voted overwhelmingly to strike. Will there be another debate between former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris? Bloomberg's Amy Morris tells us we have a pretty good indication now it is not going to happen. Donald Trump ruled out another debate with an all-caps declaration on Truth Social. Quote, there will be no third debate. He insists he won their first debate, so he doesn't need to participate in another one. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke at a campaign event in Charlotte, North Carolina, shortly after Trump's statement. I believe we owe it to the voters to have another debate. It is not clear if the vice president was directly responding to Trump's post. Trump and Harris's running mates, Republican Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio and Democratic Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, are slated to hold their own debate on October 1st with CBS News. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. And U.K. Prime Minister Keir Starmer has arrived in Washington ahead of a meeting with President Biden. Uh, sources telling Bloomberg the U.S. and U.K. discussing allowing Kyiv to conduct strikes inside Russia using British cruise missiles backed by U.S. navigational data. Well, speaking yesterday, the Russian President Vladimir Putin warned against the move. This will be their direct participation, and this, of course, will significantly change the very essence, the very nature of the conflict. This will mean that NATO countries, the U.S., and European countries are at war with Russia. Putin there through an interpreter. The discussion comes after the U.S. confirmed that Moscow has received shipments of ballistic missiles from Iran. And crews continue battling three wildfires east of Los Angeles. In San Bernardino County, there's a red glow in the sky, a strong haze in the air as the flames continue to consume the area. The three fires have scorched more than 100,000 acres. And after a hack last year at Clorox, halted production at U.S. factories and led to shortages of its popular line of fresh step cat litter. The company is realizing that um, some cats have moved on. The cat litter will be Clorox's toughest category, likely to take the longest to recover uh, from the pandemic, that, well, from the disruptions. Sales for Clorox brands like Fresh Step and Scoop Away shrank about 4% the year ended June. Business... Uh, <laughs> The business saw pretty strong demand during the pandemic. Uh, when contacted for comment, the co-founder of Cat Behavior Alliance, Linda Hall, I don't know what the hell that is, says cats hate change. There's a problem getting Kitty back to the Clorox <laughs> brand litter. So Where do you find these? I don't know. So tr you think I make this up? <laughs> this actually happens. Can you walk a cat? I've never seen this. Where I, I am? Seen, there's a guy uh, Can you, like, in Manhattan. And walk a cat? There's a guy on the Upper West Side who walks the streets with his cat on his shoulder. I. But, <laughs> that's I get. It's, Rich, help it's me. Odd. The, wake up in the control room. <laughs> you you can you walk a cat like with a leash? No, and they will have can? a fit. <laughs> you can, they it depends. will have a depends fit. Depends on cat. Oh, oh. oh. crazy beast. Anyway, that's your news <laughs> for now. Thank you, John Tucker. Taylor Swift is a cat woman, right? And so is. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, you're getting political that. there. Okay. A childless. From New York City, childless. Bloomberg Surveillance. And now look at some of the local headlines making news in the tri state. New York City Police Commissioner Edward Caban has resigned after a little more than a year running the biggest U.S. police force. This comes amid a federal investigation that led to agents searching his home. In a message to the police department on Thursday, that was seen by.
24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Little movement in futures after wins across the averages of more than half, more than half to one percent. Right now, we have Nasdaq futures little change up about five points. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, fifty-nine points. S and P futures up a tenth of a percent, or nine points. The two-year yield at three point five nine percent, down four basis points. The yield on the ten-year three point six five percent, and that's down two basis points. To commodities, we have spot gold higher, two thousand five hundred sixty-five dollars an ounce. Brent crude seventy-two dollars a barrel. W UTI crude $69 a barrel. Moving the markets, furniture retailer Restoration Hardware up 22%. It said demand picked up last quarter, lifting revenues, adjusted earnings above estimates. And then you have shares of Moderna down 4%. Following yesterday's sell off and unveiling of a cost cutting plan, really failed to reassure investors. And some news in the music world. The Financial Times says Sony Music in advance talks to buy Pink Floyd's music rights for about $500 million. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. Just a little football here right now. This is a huge deal. When, you, when a, a famous team loses, yep. pity the people they play next. Oof. Can you imagine? This is Purdue, folks. Purdue's playing... Notre Dame. Oh, I see what you're doing with Purdue. And, you know, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do it later here. But but the answer is Notre Dame lost to those other guys last week. Huge yep. deal. Northern Illinois. And I love what CBS Sports has on this where there's so much pressure to have Notre Dame ranked oh, and in a bowl I game. See. Yep, absolutely. Media. Yep. You know, your world. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Dennis Dodd, thank you for okay. that at CBS Sports. So it's 3 o'clock uh, Saturday I'll afternoon. I'll pay attention to that one. Notre Dame, Purdue. I mean, we'll have to... To see. I, I mean, they'll give the boiler up. Yeah. I mean, that's what they'll do, the boiler up. Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. Good morning, everyone. The daily look at the front page is Elisa Mateo Hour. It's brought to you by IBKR Financial Advisors Switch to interactive brokers for lowest cost, global trading and turnkey custody solutions. No ticket charges, no conflicts of your interests. Do that at ibkr.com slash RIA. Lisa, what do you have? All right, so we report on business here, but we also report on politics. We talk about politics here. There's a new poll out from the Associated Press that says, well, Americans, they're getting some political fatigue. They hear too much of it. Um, no. So some of them want to tune off a little bit. So they're saying about half Americans say they do follow political news extremely very closely. But six in 10 said they have to limit it. How much information they consume because they feel a bit overloaded. Um, there's a lot of information, right? You get it on your phone. You can see it on social media. Um, people are saying they're having a hard time figuring yeah, out what's true, some million what's on not the debate. true. On the debate, yeah. they had like 60 some million. Yep. People tuned in more than Biden Trump. I kind of like this short little season Campaign. that we're having now for the election. It's, it's kind of like a snap yeah. election. Like British. Yeah, exactly. We should do this. <laughs> I like this. That's so working out for but me. But it's, it's a breakdown. Like women more likely to feel that they need to limit it more than men. Um, so that's the difference there. But yeah, a little bit okay. of political fatigue. Okay. They're allowed. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're not in a swing state. Yeah, so well, I don't, we're not in a swing state it. because every single ad on every, it just oh, all it's day everywhere. is, yeah. It's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Next. Uh, prep schools. I know you love education. So prep schools, not just for the elite. The Wall Street Journal is saying that more are offering free rides for the middle class. So the latest example, Deerfield Academy. It's a Massachusetts Excellent boarding school. school. Yep. Yeah. It's going to start giving a free ride to any admitted student whose family earns less than $150,000 a year. The school costs $75,000 a year. Um, 48 students paying nothing to attend so far. Um, Wall Street Journal says recruiting diverse students, it really helps get them access to academic athletic programs to help them get to those elite colleges um, and it also helps the wealthier students get exposure to people of different backgrounds as well but there's other schools that have been doing it for years you have in New Hampshire Phillips um, Academy in New Hampshire awesome. and also Groton School in Massachusetts awesome. that has a cap of about $80,000 yeah. so more yeah. elite schools are starting to do well, this. These are the elite elite schools yes. and the question is down the food chain uh, do they have a luxury to do that? And they maybe don't have the uh, endowments of crop. Yeah, you know, exactly right, Tom. You Phillips nailed it. It's or, all about the or endowment. Or Lawrenceville. You know, Lawrenceville, mean, you know. we have a $700 million endowment at Lawrenceville, so they're able to yeah. be very uh, helpful to a yeah. lot of families. So yeah, um, we'll have to see. It's a yeah. challenge. Okay. Next, what do you um, Continuing with education, okay? So we heard about the Wall Street Journal's top colleges list, this right? It's about afterthoughts grades. We or? heard, no, no. <laughs> Afterthought might like this list. Um, I'm not sure, but... <laughs> 
This is the school about the best party colleges. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Are you taking <laughs> notes so in listen the car? Up after this. Where's Rutgers? Where's Rutgers? <laughs> Rutgers is not on the list, uh. unfortunately. Who do you think is number one? Okay, most of them in the South and the Midwest, they hold those top four. Okay, I got spots. in my head. Come on, come on. French Hill. Oh. Good morning, French Hill. Oh. Tulane. I was Florida. Oh, Tulane. What a shot. New Orleans. Good morning, <laughs> Ian Bremer. Good morning from Party School, New Orleans. <laughs> Number one party school, <clears throat> according to the Wall Street Journal. Number two, University of Dayton. They're actually one of two uh, schools Dayton in Ohio Flyers, really? that made the top ten. Dennis um, and the other? Another private school. Uh, when you get to public schools, number three, I, Florida State University. Oh, yeah, now we're talking. It's on Just my daughter's shot. list. I don't know about <laughs> yeah. that now. I'm crossing it off. Right. I'm crossing it up. But they did. They, they okay. surveyed a lot of kids. Um, they asked them about student life, career prep, um, classroom, dining halls. But they also asked them about the party scene. So if you want to know about Tulane, here it is. Two out of every three students said that they can find a party on campus five or more nice. nights That's of the week if they looked. 40% said that it was true seven nights a week. Wow. So you know what school is also strong. on the list and is perennially on the list from Mr. Tom Keene? University of Colorado at Boulder. No. Yes. Oh. That's I'm, shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked. My son's alma mater as well, Boulder, oh. Colorado. There's a brass plaque at the sink and we'll leave it there. <laughs> do you have one more but for us? I do. This is a, a, a record, okay? An American woman has cycled around the world. I've had enough of these people. Okay. <laughs> And you're one you, of them. You do need planes, though, because, you know, you take your yep. bike, you need yep. the planes. Okay, let's be open about that. 18,000 miles around wow. the world. She's 38 years old, Lael Wilcox, 108 days. That's what it took her to do it. But Guinness laid out these <clears throat> rules. So basically, she hopped on her bike in Chicago in May. She rode east to New York, flew to Portugal, crossed over to Europe, then traveled to Australia, New Zealand, finished with a ride from Anchorage, Alaska, back to Chicago on Wednesday. I can't can't believe she did all this. She Very did cool. have a lot of people though fly, going along with her uh, because she was posting on social media where they were going, yeah. and um, and they joined in. So Lisa Mateo with the news today. Thank you, Lisa Mateo. Thanks to Interactive Brokers mm -hmm. for that. Just a, always a whole set of uh, good stories out there. And one of them is in your free time. I mean, Lisa's working like a twenty-eight hour work. I know. Okay? I mean, she's exactly. stretching it. She does a couple hours on Sunday. In and out. Nothing above twenty-five hours. Yep. She did a piece here for Bloomberg Radio on the lack of funding for Latino-owned businesses. And okay. she won an award, Lisa Mateo, folks. Really? Trophy taking from the New York Crushing State it. Broadcasters. Winning an award for Bloomberg Radio. Thank you. No I've surprise. never won this. They don't, they don't oh, even gosh, know who I am. Yeah, They're exactly. Like, Yahoo and I. Ty, tell us about this, Lisa. It was really great. And the, the reason why I love it is because um, I, it, you just get it from talking with people in the industry. You find out their frustrations. And that's what you do as a journalist. Right. You find out you're the voice for the voiceless. So that was my purpose. Right. I appreciate the green light that I got to do it in the first place. Sparta green lighted it. Everything. <laughs> so wow. um, okay. that was the biggest thing. Yeah. It, was, it was really great. The problem is that I left the award at Penn Station. Oh. And I can't. It's you lost, lost the award. Award? I lost the you award. lost the award. Go to the lost and found today. I'm sure you'll find it. I'm sure they'll take care of it. Put in a claim. I don't think it's going Did anywhere. Did you call Mayor Adams' office? No, and I'm really upset about you it. You lost I your award. I left it at Penn Station when I was running to get my train for New Jersey. This transit. was after the third glass of champagne. <laughs> exactly. That's how, that's how it works. Oh, that's how it works. But I appreciate you the, lost the honor. The, <laughs> folks, any of you that see... A big brass trophy, <laughs> gold trophy, I should say. It looks a little bit like an Emmy or an Oscar. Station. If it's floating, in, you know, what? What's the liquor store there where you buy shots of Tito's? Oh, it's right there you know, on the main probably, floor. And probably they have cups and they have ice for you. It's yeah, just well, the Lisa greatest business that. ever. Lisa, Lisa had a to-go at Penn Station after the party. Tito's vodka and ice and left the trophy. It, ha it happens. It store. happens. Well, thank you. It's all part of community. There's a picture on Twitter in case you want to see what it looks like. <laughs> okay. I'll put him out on Penn Lisa Station. Lisa Mateo, thank you. And, of course, complete pro with the New York State, New York City yep. broadcasting. Oh, it's college football season. It's in my agreement, folks. Page 43, paragraph 4. I have to play the Purdue fight song Hail, Purdue. when they play Notre Dame. Good morning, West Lafayette and Harry's Fountain. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. We're addicted to the parlor game, the yep. Fed, the monetary ballet. Where do you see opportunities in a fixed income space here in 24? With Lisa Mateo on markets. AI affecting demand for cloud computing. And Michael Barr with news. Another legal setback for Donald Trump, this time across the pond. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Paul Sweeney, Tom King, Michael Barr on assignment, rumored to be back Monday on the Gulf Stream. Lisa Mateo here, the award-winning Lisa Mateo. Yes. Congratulations again. One more time. But don't entrust that. her with anything you of know, value. <laughs> Friday, the weather, folks, for those of you across the nation with major uh, regret to the West, where heating, yeah, the heat temperatures been terrible fires. Our weather is like perfect. Perfect. I mean, perfect. like the it just it's like California. It just sits. It does no wind. It nope. just. It's perfect. It's just perfect. Yep. And Somebody should be on the beach this, this so, weekend. You know, I, yeah, we should. I mean, I thought like Friday, we just slide through it. Not. There's a lot going on. We had a really strong hour talking about more optimism in the markets. Michael Purvis going up to 5,800. Ed Hyman's people looking for a soft landing. Paul, what's your tone on yields? Yields are screaming. September 18th is important for the Fed. September 18th is important for the Fed, Tom, but the market's already kind of priced it all in here. And we got a five-year, um, a two-year Treasury yield that went from 5% just a cup of coffee ago. We're now below 3.6% on the two-year Treasury. The Treasury market's saying, we, we've got you, Fed. Yeah. We, we, we know where things are going. <clears throat> okay, we're going to get to this right now. We've got our conversation of the day in the equity markets with Katie Kaminsky coming up. Good morning on YouTube across the nation. As you compute, commute on Apple CarPlay, Android Auto on our three stations in the corridor, 99.1 FM Washington, 11.30 AM New York. Good morning, 92.9 FM uh, Boston. Remember YouTube, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast to gaze at the award-winning Lisa Mateo from the Interactive Broker Studios, our Bloomberg Business Flash. Lisa Mateo, we get to speak to her. <laughs> Thank yep. you very much. Talk to my people. Futures, trying to keep up that momentum from yesterday's gains. Right now we have NASDAQ futures, little change up about 11 points. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, 62 points. Uh, S&P futures up two tenths of a percent or 11 points. Yeah, right. We have the two-year yield at 3.59%. That's down four basis points. A yield on the 10-year, 3.66%. And that's down one basis point. To commodities, we have spot gold higher, $2,567 an ounce. Brent crude $72 a barrel, WTI crude $69 a barrel. Shares of Boeing down 4%. We've been talking about it. Its factory workers started their first walkout in 16 years. Over to American Airlines. Flight attendants approved a contract that's going to raise wages as much as 20%, increase pay benefits by $4.2 billion over five years. American Airlines up about half a percent. Meanwhile, you have Southwest Airlines flight attendants. They got the green light from a judge to move forward at this class action. Claims that their attendance policy change punishes workers who take medical and family leave. Southwest up two-tenths of a percent. And the Wall Street Journal saying United Airlines. It selected Elon Musk's Starlink service for in-flight in Internet. Uh, United Airlines down about two tenths of a percent. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. Bloomberg Surveillance this morning and always. Brought to you by Cone Resnick Advisory Assurance Tax. Is your business future ready? Talk to Cone Resnick's digital advisory team about strategies and platforms to drive competitive advantage. Thank you, Cone Resnick, for your support. From Massachusetts, the Charles River, Katie Kaminsky joins. Chief Research Strategist, Alpha uh, Simplex. Katie, have we reaffirmed a bull market? You and I are trend-based. I'm looking at all sorts of percolations, parabolic SAR, climate exponential moving averages, and the vectors pointing up. Do you agree? I agree on equities, but I'm still really nervous on the other asset classes. So that I'd say yes and no. So. <laughs> What, what's that? That's not a radio answer. That's an that's economic. A TV. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a TV. Yeah. You, you say yes okay. and no on TV. On radio, I need well, a damn yes, answer. Yes, I agree for equities. Yes, I mean I think there's still a moderate and sort of given what happened last month, signals abated, volatility came in and dissipated some of the strength that we saw earlier this year, and we're going to continue to see some sort of we've seen some recovery. So we're some somewhat moderately long you know long views and equities. But 
when you look at the other asset classes, that's what's been making me nervous because you've seen strong fixed income long signals, you've seen short commodity views, you're seeing long gold um, and short, the dollar's been under pressure too. So that that's a little defensive. You mentioned, you mentioned the dollar, Katie. I mean, uh, again, we've seen weakness here in the dollar here. I mean, I always ask my FX folks here, is there ever a case, a bear case for the U.S. dollar? Is this a bear market for the U.S. dollar or is this just some short-term trading pressure? So I think there is definitely a case right now with monetary policy going in with cuts. That's naturally going to put... Uh, pressure on the dollar. And that's been the key theme for the last two or three months. And we've seen, I'll just be honest with you, currencies has been the toughest asset class this year to mm. trend because the signals have been much more volatile. And so you've seen a lot of back and forth, which is not, you know, has not been an easy trend to trade. So the signal to noise ratio has been low. Um, but more recently, especially the last two months, definitely with the theme of, you know, U.S. cutting rates, that has put pressure right. on the dollar. Katie, from a CTA standpoint, people that follow trends, is it a good time? Are trends efficacious now or is it sto what the pros say, folks, it's so stochastic that you just can't get conviction? I think I actually think it's a good time because what happens with trend is as we go through a period of inflection, so when signals reduce and then pivot, and you see a positioning move from one theme to another, that's when you have this opportunity to break out. And so what we've been watching is some of the key things that have been building in our signals, and that's been a focus on potential for a harder landing, potential potential for economic weakness, and that is seen outside of the equity markets. And I think for me, when you look at past reversal periods, those other asset classes is where you have something to, you know, to hedge opportunities if we should find uh, right. some difficulties this fall. Do you have a belief on gold? I've never asked you this. Does Katie Kaminsky look at gold? <laughs> I mean, what was it, Paul? Record high yesterday? Where are we? Yeah. 25. We're almost at 2,600 on Amazing. gold. Mike Catherine McGlone. Kaminsky on gold. <laughs> So gold is, I mean, it's amazing. I think the recent rally may be attributed to the dollar being weaker and real rates going down. But, you know, really, if you look at that trend, it's just, you know, we should just be buying gold this year. You know, it's it's really, it's been very strong and it's been very resilient throughout the entire year. Um, so, you know, it's the one that kind of sticks out versus other commodities that are more demand focused, like energies and, and metals. Well, I don't know much about commodities. I'm pretty proud of that, but by the way, but the function I do know is BCOM, BCO on the Bloomberg Commodities Index. Index. And boy, Take that's down 10% <laughs> just over the summer, I guess. I mean, yeah. what's that telling you, Katie? So that's part of what this defensive narrative that I've been concerned about. It feels a little bit like the trends right now are hedged. So there's still long equity views in trends, but that's coupled with short right. positioning in commodities. Uh, what I'm worried about is what happens after cuts next week? Once we start having cuts, does the market pivot again or do we continue? Right. Katie, this has been wonderful. Our theme today, Catherine, is uh, Notre Dame got, they were, they lost. And in my agreement with Bloomberg, I have to talk of Purdue football. So today we're looking at like, you know, pro football, like what they play out in South Bend and West Lafayette. I noticed Katie Kaminsky that the fighting MIT crew, they beat Bridgewater State wow. in football. And I was looking at Carson Phelps of Wichita, Kansas. I mean, this kid, Katie, he's a math major. He's like, MIT. he's like real MIT, like Katie. Like, you know, this kid never knew a B in his, his, <laughs> B in his life. Katie, is there a fight song at MIT? <laughs> is there a, a, a fight there, song? There actually it? is, and it's basically a, a math fight song. And it, it, it has like E to the X pi. I wish I remembered it, but uh, oh it's got, look it's it got the MIT. Math team, math team, go, go, go. <laughs> Katie, it's a do, lot of calculus. Does, <laughs> it, does it have Euler's function in it with the minus one stuck on the right side? I think it does. Actually, it's it does e, it does have e to the x, y, oh, cosine, sine, something awesome. like that. But look it up. It's really it's 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 a great math 
chant. Bronze, <laughs> Katie Kaminsky, thank you so much. From uh, the shores of the Charles River, eat the pie eye or whatever <laughs> it is. There was somebody who said, I think Einstein said, if you don't understand Euler's function, go home. Yeah, just, it's just you're not, you're not for real. Trust me, I went home. That's I table stakes I right didn't there. get it. Now joining us, our mathematician with the news from New York City, John Tucker. All right, good morning. Let's start off with this. Machinists at Boeing voting to go on strike in a news conference after the vote. Union President John Holden revealed the results. Our members rejected the contract by 94.6 percent and they voted to strike by 96 percent. This is the first walkout at Boeing since 2008. Uh, another setback for the aircraft maker. His reputation in finances has been battered recently. Kamala Harris making a pitch to swing state voters as she heads back out on the campaign trail. I believe we owe it to the voters to have another debate. Well, Donald Trump has ruled that out now. The vice president did cook off her post-debate blitz in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Harris is going to be back in Pennsylvania today for two more back-to-back -back rallies. The Justice Department preparing criminal charges in connection with an Iranian hack that targeted Donald Trump's presidential campaign. More from Washington this morning and Bloomberg's Steve Podisk. The prospect of criminal charges comes as the Justice Department has raised alarms about aggressive efforts by countries, including Russia and Iran, to meddle in the presidential election. It was not immediately clear when the charges might be announced. Assistant Attorney General Matthew Olson, the Justice Department's top national security official, said in a speech Thursday Iran is making a greater effort to influence this year's election than it has in prior election cycles, and that Iranian activity is growing increasingly aggressive as this election nears. In Washington, Steve Potusk, Bloomberg Radio. Elon Musk has labeled the Australian government as fascists. This comes over a proposed new law to crack down on digital misinformation, particularly on social media websites. Under the proposed legislation, which has yet to pass parliament, social media companies could be fined up to 5% of their annual revenue if they fail to take steps to manage the risk that misinformation and disinformation on digital communications platform poses in that country. And the UK's police and crime minister, Dame Diana Johnson, gave a speech to the Police Superintendents Association conference in which she warned of an epidemic of antisocial behavior, theft and shoplifting that the Labour government had inherited from the Conservatives. At that same police conference, she had her purse stolen. The theft came on the same day the government began releasing some prisoners early to deal with jail overcrowding in England and Wales. Global News, 24 hours a day. Whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now, I'm John Tucker. This is Bloomberg. Paul, Tom, and the award-winning Lisa, Lisa Mateo. Mateo. Okay, MIT, they're the beavers. You get the ring. Uh, Charles Lieberman was in the other day with a classic MIT ring with a little oh. cute beaver on okay. it. It's a famous ring. Here's the cheer. I'm a beaver, you're a beaver. We are beavers all. And when we get together, we do the beaver call. E to the U, D, U, D, X. E to the X, D, X. Cosine, secant, tangent, sine, 3.14159. <laughs> Integral, radical, mu, div, slipstick, oh, yeah. slide yeah, yeah. rule, MIT, go tech. All right. Do they get a lot of dates with this? Yeah, I was saying they get a lot of dates with it. They're like magnets. There's a bar. There's, I can't remember the name of the bar right now on, uh, Char on uh, Charles Avenue going north. Uh, I, I can just see it. I mean, you know, I mean, and they're not drinking Narragansett lager beer. No, no. They're drinking some craft, you know. Yes, of course. Fancy craft. Well, good for them. The world needs engineers. E to the U, D, U, D, X. Oh, man. Oh, man, does that bring back <laughs> memories. <laughs> Futures up 11. Captain Kaminsky, thank you. Bloomberg Surveillance. And now look at some of the...
today on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures, well, pretty much treading water. Fresh data from U.S. from the U.S. kept investors guessing on the size of an expected rate cut from the Federal Reserve. Now, former Fed official Bill Dudley said there's a, quote, strong case for a 50 basis point cut next week. Today, we have more economic data with a read on import prices for August. That's about 15 minutes from now. And also sentiment, that's after the open. So we have Nasdaq futures, little change, up about 15 points. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, 63 points. S&P futures futures up two tenths of a percent or 12 points. The two year yield at 3.59 percent. That's down four basis points. A yield on the 10 year 3.66 percent and that's up one basis point. To currencies, the dollar weaker Japanese yen stronger up seven tenths of a percent at 140.84 against the dollar. The euro stronger British pound weaker. We have Bitcoin down about half a percent at around 57,000. To earnings we go. Adobe down eight percent after its revenue forecast. Well, it failed to reflect an AI uplift on the flip side, you have Oracle. They're up 6%. Investors cheer their long-term sales targets. And finally, OpenAI. It's released a new AI model that can perform some human-like reasoning tasks. For on-demand news 24 hours a day, supply, subscribe to Bloomberg's News Now wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Mateo. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lisa. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. We've had all sorts of different views, starting with Michael Purvis's lift to 5,800 mm -hmm. on yep. SPX this morning. But with the quant, the mathematics, the epsilon, the Greek letters of Katie <laughs> Kaminsky. Let's get real. This weekend, over a beverage of your choice, maybe you're at the beach, maybe you're at a kitchen table trying to figure out what to do about the rent increase. You want to listen to Emily Rowland. Co-chief investment strategist for a small shop up in Boston. They have they have two they have old John Hancock and new John Hancock. I like the old John, John uh, Hancock yeah, Tower. Yeah, well, there's a lot of memories yep. and, and, and all that. Emily joins us this morning. Emily, you have nailed by quality, by America, try to push aside all the noise. We've renoised after the first week of August. How do you <laughs> reset for 2025? We continue, Tom, to have our eye on the ball here. Um, we are continuing to emphasize high quality stocks. We think we're in this late cycle environment where the lagged impact of Fed tightening hasn't tipped us into recession. We continue to spend like crazy in the United States. Um, not a political statement, by the way, it's just happening. Um, and that's extending the cycle. We wanna be careful of reaching too far for risk. We wanna start even legging into more some more defensive parts of the market. And we continue to want to embrace the income that's available now in high quality bonds. What's the, for you guys at State Street, what is quality, legging into the quality part of the market? What does that mean for you guys? Yeah, so it's companies with great balance sheets. They have a ton of cash, great return on equity. Think about a company with a limited need to tap the capital markets in order to grow. And with the cost of capital still elevated, you know, companies are now contending with margin pressure. Revenue growth was awesome during the height of the pandemic as companies could pass those higher prices along. Now record revenue growth is slowing, margins are compressing, and the companies are gonna, that are gonna do the best are the ones that can defend those margins. And we're finding right. a lot of that in the quality factor and right. most notably in technology. Emily, it's away from your remit, but let's keep the theme going. I need a hat trick right now. And, and that is, we had two opinions earlier this week, separate and discreet, re reaffirming double-digit earnings growth. I assume you're there, but can you state to us that you see persistency of quality margins that lead to double-digit earning growth? Yeah, I think it's you, you can find it, but it's going to be concentrated in those companies. Luckily, the quality factor has concentration in mega cap tech. And of course, those names are dominating the market. If you look at earnings growth just this quarter, half of it was driven by the communication services and technology sector. Revenue growth is coming from those areas of the market. So as long as you can see that holding up, I think you can get there. Now, Tom, the great news is uh, the bar for Q3 is really low. Analysts are penciling in 3.8% year over year earnings growth. So I think we should just enjoy it while we can. Like you guys are enjoying the Yankees right now, beating the Red Sox. Like, oh, enjoy what you can. Emily, you're killing me. Stop it. You know, <laughs> we might get me. better. 
I, I, so. mean, I mean, you could see from the new John Hancock, if you go up higher, you could see the lack of offense oh, up yeah. at Fenway. It's like a cloud over <laughs> exactly. Fenway Park. Paul, NVIDIA, Paul, you were on this. Yeah, so. From the peak down 21%. I know. And, and Tom raised a great question, Emily. If you think about NVIDIA, you think about AI, that's been such a driver of the stock market performance for the last almost two years here. If the AI trade is kind of played out, does that bring some risk into the marketplace that we need to account for? Yeah, it does because of that concentration. And look, we're bumping up on 30 times forward earnings for the U.S. technology sector. That's about as high as we've gotten over the course of this cycle. Now, of course, it's not the 50 times forward earnings we saw in the late 1990s, but certainly right. there's been a lot of multiple expansion there. The good news is if you do the math, you guys seem to be doing a lot of math this morning. Yeah, you know, uh, so let me just get in on the party. Two plus two. If you look at the PE ratio, we, we would focus on the denominator. Look at the earnings. And you can blame a lot of things for any reset in the technology sector, but it's multiple right. compression. It is not earnings. The earnings are there, the fundamental case for AI is there. It's just the love affair with it is probably yeah. a bit extended. Paul, NVIDIA, 56 times PE, forward PE, only to January of next year yeah. is a 42. Yeah, and it gets to a 30 handle on the following year. So this is a company that, that's earning its way into its multiple. That's what the bulls will tell that's you here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, uh, this Federal Reserve, uh, Emily, it seems like it, it's, it's ready to begin a, a cutting cycle. How does that kind of impact how you guys are thinking about stocks, bonds, commodities, all that kind of stuff? Well, Paul, it comes down to what's already priced in to the bond market. Um, you know, the bond market is putting pressure on the Fed right now because we've got five rate cuts priced in for this year. So if you start to hear the Fed coming out on ne next Wednesday, as a, even a little bit more hawkish than what's already priced in the market, I think you might see a repricing there. You'd see bond yields backing up. That would likely cause the dollar to appreciate. It would be. It would put some, uh, you know, some pressure on equity markets very likely here. So we've got to hear a, a more dovish Fed just to fit in with what the market is already pricing in. Right. What are you doing with cash? I got 30 seconds. Cash, 5%. It's going to be 4.99%. What happens, Emily Rowland? Yeah, cash is subject to massive reinvestment risk here. We would go out into the belly of the curve, lock in higher rates there. The ag is yielding above 4%. Still, still get it while you can. Income, 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 get paid to wait. Emily Rowland, thank you for the brief. Really love it. That's what we love to do on surveillance, folks. Have someone like Katie Kaminsky and who's doing yep. total Greek letter math nerd fest. And they go to Emily Rowland, who's talking really basic block and tackle belief with a three-year holding pattern, five-year holding pattern. Even better, Paul, we got Chris Morangi coming up. That's a, exactly right. Now, so that was just a couple of segments in a row with Boston-based smart uh, folks. And that brings us to, uh, if you want to listen to Bloomberg Radio, 92.9 FM up there. It's a big signal, Tom, for all our oh, friends I up there the, in overall New England. Okay. Do you realize that the Yankees beat the Red Sox tonight? Ooh. The dreaded Red Sox are playing 500 ball, and even worse, that's an improvement on last year at this time. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you guys are doing up there. I don't know what you guys are doing. We're not spending money. I mean, look at so uh, Rich. The Soto is he with the Yankees next year? Juan Soto. Yankees, Yankees are Mets. Says, your guess. That's the smart talk right there. That was a trade of the year. You talk about the trading deadline. Steve Cohen traded for Scott Havens. Who? It was uh, he traded for Scott Havens. Okay. And, you know, it's an amazing trade. Look at the Mets. They're like, you know, I can't, I, the, I can't even talk about the Mets. I get so upset. I see their uniforms. Yep. And it's just painful. Well, Rich brings up a good point. Juan Soto. I mean, one arguably it's the best hitter in baseball. Great to watch. Had a big dinger a couple nights ago when I was up there at the stadium. Um, Yankees would love to right. have him. Oh my goodness. You think Wright and uh, 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 Judge and him and Stanton right. for the next few years? How good would that be? But. Stevie Cohen's got a big checkbook over with the Mets. Oh, that would so we'll be see. true. We say good morning to the Yankees and the brilliance of Juan Soto more than anyone since Wade Boggs. He's someone who puts it in play. And of course, all yep. of us, our thoughts to Wade Boggs as he fights cancer. He announced that right. uh, this week. Yep. Wade Boggs, best of fortune great, great player. in fighting uh, that illness. Futures up 11, down futures up 57 across the nation. Uh, in your office, at home, YouTube, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts. Thank you for that. Number one way to help Lisa Mateo. On your commute, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and of course, 99.1 FM Washington, 
Bloomberg 1130, New York. Good morning. and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures in the green. This is as investors place our bets on the size of rate cuts from the Fed next week. Now, according to economists surveyed by Bloomberg News, policymakers likely to lower interest rates by a quarter point next week and at each of the two following meetings. Right now we have NASDAQ futures little changed up about three points. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, 74 points at 41,219. S&P futures up a tenth of a percent, 10 points at 5,613. We head over to the two-year yield at 3.59 percent. That's down four basis points. The yield on the 10-year, 3.65 percent, and that's down two basis points. We have spot gold higher, $2,569 an ounce. Print crude, $72 a barrel. WTI crude, $69 a barrel. Companies making news, Amazon, they plan to spend an additional $2.1 billion on its contract delivery unit. Um, it could include pay raises to almost $22 an hour. 
And then 4,800 people working at Verizon. They took up the company's offer to basically walk away with an exchange for a severance package that will cost Verizon up to $1.9 billion. And Charter Communications cable TV customers getting a perk as part of a new distribution agreement between Warner Brothers Discovery and Charter. They'll be able to stream HBO for free. Warner Brothers Discovery up two tenths, Charter up about 3%. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. Greatly appreciate it. Good morning, everyone, across uh, the nation. Economic indicators, Michigan, you do Michigan, 10 a.m. Yeah, you Michigan, mentioned. all yep. that inflation expectations. Yep. Talk about a fight song. Maybe the best fight song of all time. Yeah, with 111,000 people. They yeah. don't have 111,000 people at MIT. Oh, my gosh. Or yeah. Williams College. Or Williams College as well. We say good morning to all of you. And, of course, our economic indicators, our foundation, brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000. Independent financial advisors with a two to one advisor to staff ratio, small firm attentiveness, big advisor impact. Go to Commonwealth.com, Commonwealth.com to learn about their consultative support in technology. Mr. Roth, Ross in Miami is talking to PE firms, really? private equity firms wow. about some form of interest in the Buffalo Bills winning, Miami Dolphins losing, Miami <laughs> Dolphins. I'm sure there's going to be huge interest, Tom. And you said this is a huge deal. I think like, it's a huge they're deal. They're cashing in. I think it's a huge deal for a lot of these families to get some liquidity right. um, in these amazingly valued uh, right. assets while still maintaining control. So we'll see how it goes. I think this is going to be a big, big deal for NFL. We now speak to those that do and yep. do not talk. Mario Gabelli and Chris Morangi have just been out front looking at John Malone and Liberty Media and the small ownership of a baseball team that's always there in October, the Atlanta Braves. Chris, honored to ask you this question. Is PE ownership going to ruin sports and sport investment? <laughs> Morning, Tom and Paul. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, these owners obviously have very valuable assets. The average NFL team is worth something like Six billion, six or seven billion, and um, they want liquidity. And private equity is a way for them to access that. Um, the NFL has put pretty strict rules in place as to how uh, private equity firms come into the sport. They've approved four groups um, to be able to do this. Uh, and um, I think it'll be manageable. But for now, if you're a public market investor, you've got a limited uh, means of investing in sports. And Liberty Braves, now called Atlanta Braves holding is our favorite way of participating. <laughs> so, hey, Chris, stepping back a little bit here, I'm just kind of thinking about the earnings season we've just been through. And I know we've got September's a big month for conferences. We just had the financial, the, the big investment banks participating in a conference where they're talking about slowing growth. Um, the economy's slowing, maybe the consumer's tired. I mean, that seems to be a, a theme here. If that is, in fact, a theme, how do you play that, Chris? Yeah, sir, we, we've seen increasing evidence uh, that the consumer is tired. They've spent most of their COVID-era savings. Um, and you're, you're seeing this everywhere from trading down in the grocery store to foregoing trips to the Orlando parks, et cetera. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously the debate today on Wall Street is, do we enter a recession? How long? How deep? Uh, and what's the Fed reaction? And, you know, I think certainly increasing consensus that, the Fed is going to be cutting and uh, perhaps cutting aggressively. Uh, but the direction of travel is we get back down towards some kind of neutral rate next year, or that's 3% or, or lower, and um, but growth slows. Right. And so we are uh, advocating <coughs> finding companies with defensive uh, businesses that can benefit from rate tailwinds. One of your top holdings is Berkshire Hathaway. People are trump trumpeting them with Apple ownership as a mag eight. Is Berkshire Hathaway a banking franchise unloading Bank of America, or is it a tech uh, play with Apple? <laughs> well, Berkshire Hathaway obviously is largely about the culture that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have built at that firm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, seeing them lighten up, I've seen Warren lighten up on the Apple holdings. Uh, is great. Um, you know, obviously he's, he's sensitive about valuation. He's sensitive about what his successors will be able to do, and he's freeing up capital, perhaps to do another big deal at, at some point uh, if we go into recession. 
uh, but he's just uh, increasing the financial flexibility, uh, which uh, Berkshire certainly has plenty of. Hey, Chris, one of the the best businesses that I've come across in my career is the tower business, the communications tower business. These are the wireless towers that you see all across America along the highways and byways and on the farms, and they hold all the antennas for you know your cellular telephone companies and, and whatnot. American Tower is one of those companies. I know it's a name that you guys have an interest in. Talk to us about your your idea behind American Tower AMT. Yeah, so you know, Paul, as you as you laid out, these are fabulous businesses. You've got a tower in the neighborhood. It's very difficult to site them. Uh, and um, you hang an antenna for Verizon, then you hang an antenna for AT&T, and then uh, eventually T-Mobile, and the incremental profits are, are very high and uh, very long lasting. Uh, and you benefit from each new generation of wireless technology. So going from 3G to 4G and now to 5G right. um, gets you more money. Uh, and so, um, but you know, the, the tower companies were hit pretty hard as, as rates went up, they have served as bond proxies for a long time. There are also some idiosyncratic elements around AMT, American Tower. They were in the India in business in India, which is a tough market. They're exiting that by the end of the year, uh, and they are best in class right. uh, in the U.S. today. Uh, Chris Marenghi, where are you and Mario Gabelli on the disaster known as Hollywood? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it's a question we'd ask Mario from time and again, and I guess even Mr. Malone, but Gordon Crawford at Capital Group and the rest. Chris Marenghi, on Paramount, on Warner Brothers Discovery, I haven't even looked at a chart at Disney. It's so painful. Where are you on that, Chris? Well, we're sharing the pain, obviously. But um, you know, obviously, some interest, an interesting development yesterday. I mentioned uh, a bit earlier in the program. You know, Charter and Warner Brothers are doing a very forward-looking deal. David Zaslav, who runs uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, is being out ahead of this. What would I call the great reaggregation? Re that is. Um, you're going to rebundle. There are going to be fewer streaming services, whether that's because some of them go out of business or more likely we see consolidation in the space. But you're going to probably be receiving those uh, streaming services from the old cable companies who are selling you broadband. And um, you're getting, they're going to be priced um, more attractively. They're going to be uh, easier to access uh, with the, the technology that they provide. Uh, and um, you know it's a great time to be a consumer in this business because there's so much content out there. It's not as great a time to be an <laughs> investor, but that's changing. We are seeing some rationalization. So Chris, you've known, and Mario's known John Malone for such a long time, and he's got still a lot of exposure to what I would call traditional or legacy media. At this stage of his life, what do you think he does, generally speaking, with those types of holdings? Well, in general, we've seen a, a simplification of his holdings. Um, and you know, I should mention that John, of course, is on both sides of that Warner Brothers and Discovery uh, transaction. Liberty Broadband, which is one of his companies, owns 26% of Charter. And then, of course, John has his personal holdings in Discovery, which uh, which go back to, well, the beginnings of, of Liberty Media uh, when it was uh, spun off in, in 2004. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we're seeing rationalization. We just saw also this week uh, Liberty Sirius, which was a, a Liberty entity that owned 82% of Sirius XM radio. Uh, that was uh, split off and merged into Sirius, so now we have one entity there. Um, obviously, the Braves, uh, which we talked about earlier, that was split off last year. I think that gets sold. Liberty Global, which is holding in Europe, uh, is going to spin off their Swiss business uh, by the end of this year. Uh, so I think you know we're going to see a reshuffling of the debt, a great simplification of what ultimately will be his estate. Chris, thank you so much. Chris Marangi with us with the Gabelli. Yes, Wide-ranging conversation there, including, of course, uh, where we see uh, in the in the monetization of these billions, an average NFL team is, is six billion. Yeah, I, I, like right one now, team I would never blink watch. your eye and it's going to be higher tomorrow. So if they're six billion, what does that make, like the Dallas Cowboys? Exactly. I, I don't. Our good friends at Sportico, they do some great work on that. Yeah. Some ex Bloomberg guys. Yeah, we'll have to see. Of course, uh, we'll continue to follow the Miami Dolphins story uh, this morning. Bloomberg surveillance. We're brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Their bond marketplace. Access Interactive Brokers' vast selection of over 1 million global fixed income securities, no markups, no built-in spreads, low transparent commissions. Learn more at ibkr.com slash bonds. Red and green on the screen, futures up six. With our news in New York City, John Tucker. All right, Tom, Paul, and Lisa, after back-to-back -back rallies in North Carolina, 
Kamala Harris is holding two more rallies today in another key swing state, Pennsylvania. Uh, let's get more from Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove. Pennsylvania looks like it's increasingly the ball game. The polls look really good for them in Wisconsin and Michigan. And the question is, how do you get those other 19 electoral college votes? Well, magic number, Pennsylvania has 19. So to win, she either needs Pennsylvania or she needs some combination of other states, Nevada, plus either North Carolina or Georgia would get her there. Those are, of course, traditionally less blue states, although some polling has her competitive or even leading recently in North Carolina, for instance. You're going to see both of them in Pennsylvania all the time. Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove reports Donald Trump is on a West Coast swing right now after a rally in Arizona. He's going to be holding a news conference in a state that's uh, not expected to be a battleground for Republicans, California. Meantime, Donald Trump making a new pledge if he's elected. No taxes on overtime pay. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has more. Seeking to gain footing after the shaky debate, this is an effort by him and his strategist to change the focus from debates and hit the road to rallies and promises. As one in Arizona aimed at a blue-collar workers that he needs to win, he says the people who work overtime are among the hardest-working citizens in our country. Now, over the last three months, Trump has rolled out a steady drumbeat of tax cut plans. He has not explained yet how to pay for them. And a Bloomberg review says they would add more than $10.5 trillion to the national debt over the next 10 years. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. And the world's most desperately needed airplane is back in production. Um, no, it's not from Boeing or Airbus. It's made by de Havilland Aircraft of Canada. It's a specialized amphibious firefighting plane that can hold as much as 1,600 gallons of water as climate change makes wildfires more frequent. It's needed more than ever. They were out of production for almost 10 years. Uh, De Havilland also used to make the, uh, the iconic yeah. beaver, which, uh, you know, the seaplane. That's right. Yeah. Harrison Ford, the actor, has one, swears yeah. by it. It's Gorgeous serious plane. stuff up there. I mean, that's how you get from point A to point B. Up in the Great in the White North. Uh, uh, all right, John Tucker, thank you uh, so much. Robin Wigglesworth writing it up at the FT. I think Lisa's going to feature this Monday. Okay. We're going to get out front on it right now. A paper out of the St. Louis Fed, three PhD economists, and they write up how modern dating exacerbates inequality. We go to surveillance dating expert John Tucker uh, on this. <laughs> Our findings of minimal changes in preferences, selectivity, in aggregate sorting of couple. Well, this sounds really romantic. Yeah. <laughs> the unexpected finding is that the proliferation of dating apps seems to have had a minimal impact on who John Tucker ends up marrying. John, I mean, we're talking here Tinder. I mean, when you were on Tinder, what was it like? <laughs> Uh, Johnny never been on Tinder. <laughs> Did you know Lisa, um, like a teenager, tried to pick her up a couple of months ago? What was that story in the Walmart? And Walgreens. That's Walgreens. Okay. Walgreens. <laughs> She's still got it going on. There you go. Don't need an app for that. Bloomberg Change Surveillance. John, you have news. And now look at some of the local headlines making news in the tri-state. New York City Police Commissioner Edward Caban has resigned.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Little movement in futures. This is after wins across the averages of more than a half to 1%. So right now we'll start with NASDAQ futures. Little change down about 10 points. Dow futures up a tenth of a percent, 46 points. And we have S&P futures up a tenth of a percent or eight points. We have the two-year yield 3.60%, up three basis points. A yield on the 10-year 3.67%, and that is little change. To commodity spot gold higher, $2,571 an ounce. Brent crude $72 a barrel. WTI crude $69 a barrel. Moving the markets, that's furniture retailer Restoration Hardware. They're up 19 percent. It said demand really picked up last quarter, lifting revenues, adjusted earnings above estimates. And then you have shares of Moderna down 4 percent. I was following yesterday's sell-off. It unveiled a cost-cutting plan, really failed to reassure investors. And finally, Redfin reporting the U.S. housing market just had its worst spring selling season in a <laughs> dozen years. Some of the biggest drop-offs in cities like Florida and Texas. That is a Bloomberg yeah. business flash, Tom Surprise. and Paul. I have a Redfin feed for different cities. I'm just curious about it. And yeah. everything's a price decline. Yeah, I, I mean, mean just, every just email after email is 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 down. you got to live there. Uh, this is not only uh, uh, timely, but it's also a great honor. There's a guy named Marty at Bloomberg, and he thinks I'm a journalist. He's the only one. Uh, everybody else is like, you're kidding me. This guy from Wall Street, and you know what LIBOR is, and you know, yeah. the, the MIT fight song with all the mathematics. We have a few real journalists, and one of them is one S. Baker. Stephanie Baker is, is it's authoritative, deep, penetrating, and you end up in her new book with 340 pages of punishing Putin inside the global economic war to bring down Russia. And I'm not going to mince words. This is a book that alludes to the TV show Slow Horses. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And she's nasty. I mean, she does amazing work on Evgeny Kochman, Graham Bonham Carter, Olga Shriki, Vladimir Voronchenko, Ekaterina Voronina, and Jack Hannock. Forget about Putin. Who are these people that are enablers, friends, and fixers? You did a good job on the pronunciation there. Did you okay? Yeah, you did That's okay. That's because I'm watching Slow Horses. Yeah, Continue. yeah. <laughs> um, those are those are in the category of fixers and enablers, and they have been targeted by the Justice Department as part of a push by something called the Klepto Capture Task Force to go after sanctions evasion. And what they've done is, and particularly in the United States, they've gone after these big oligarchs who, many of whom were sanctioned going back to 2018, so they had a track record uh, to look at for sanctions evasion. They've frozen their assets, and they're now trying to forfeit those assets, sell them right. for Ukraine. It's slow, it's you know difficult. It's going through the court <clears throat> process, as it should, um, but it's been a, a sea change in the approach to Russian money and yeah. sanctions evasion. But the bottom line is you got 4,000 square feet in Mayfair. You're mostly in London, Stephanie. What everybody in America wants to know is why can't the United Kingdom catch up with our seriousness? Is, is the United Kingdom, continental Europe, are they punishing Putin? They are, but you're right in saying that they have been slow. They really only got their act together to uh, sanction Russia and these Russian billionaires in 20, 2022 after Putin's full-scale invasion. Um, they have The UK has frozen something like 22 billion pounds worth of Russian assets, but Unlike the U.S., they don't have that track record going back. Well, you know, when sanctions enforcement was weak, they weren't. They hadn't sanctioned these guys back in 2018, so they don't really have a period of time to look at to be like, "Gotcha, you were evading these sanctions. We're going to go after you." So it's been much harder. They don't have uh, an FBI. They have a, a, a weak law enforcement that's not quite as up to the task going after white collar criminals. Uh, Stephanie, your book is punishing Putin inside the global economic war to bring down Russia. Is it effective? Is it working? It's a really good question. And you're right. They haven't been as effective as many hoped early on in the war. I think because some of the sanctions that they undertook were so unprecedented, there were sort of frothy, there was frothy optimism that this would really bring Russia to its knees. But what happened is Russia rebounded, mm -hmm. in particular off of global oil revenues. And that's what I detail in the book, Punishing Putin, that 
the main challenge facing right. the West is Russia's oil revenues. Russia's oil has been the mainstay of their economy for decades, and until they can figure out how to undercut Russian right. oil revenues, it's going to be impossible to kind of attack Putin's ability to wage war. The journalism of Stephanie Baker, line by line in this book, 300 plus pages punishing Putin, a guy named Taleb of the Black Swan, an authoritative a gripping investigation. Page 97, I was there. The difference is I was in Helsinki in a cigar bar. John Bolton, controversial, good friend of the show, thank you, Ambassador uh, Bolton, he's there with Trump. What did Trump do in Helsinki? Did he punish Putin? Well, we don't know because there were no notes taken and there was only his translator present. So um, I do go into that to some degree in the book, but one of the crucial points is, as we know what happened in Helsinki, he basically fawned praise on, on Putin, said he believed him when it came to... Would we see that in a second term? That's the big concern, in particular with Ukrainians. He was very skeptical, Trump was very skeptical of sanctions in his first administration, rolled out the sanctions that he did under pressure from Congress and his national security advisors. He said, Trump has said he will solve the war in a day. And I think a lot of Ukrainians are worried that that's going to mean he's going to force them to cede territory. And in order to get Putin to agree, he's going to agree to lift sanctions or at least give Russia some sanctions relief, which is exactly what Putin wants. Because even if the sanctions aren't working as well, they're still costing Russia hundreds of billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Putin wants some sanctions relief to regroup and rearm. Yeah. So are these sanctions, are they impacting everyday Russians to the point where they may, I guess, reduce their support of Putin? Do we have any evidence that that's happening? Well, what they've done so far, you're, what Russia is facing is very high inflation. So okay. inflation is like 9%. They just hiked interest rates today to 19%. Wow. Um, and that's partly because of the war economy. Putin has been showering the defense industry with money. Um, he's been paying these soldiers um, huge bonuses to go fight on the front line. I just heard that from a, a friend of mine who has a brother who's fighting. And it, it, he's, he's so wealthy now. Yeah, I mean, I mean upgraded his apartment and now is driving a nice car and that's kind of unsustainable at this yes. point because they're facing labor shortages both in terms of uh, def staffing defense factories right. as well as getting people to sign up to fight and they've had to increase those bonuses even more to persuade people to join the right. front line. I want you to talk now about the world class intensity of your journalism. You came out of Oberlin. Yeah. Darken the door and all which it LSE. Fine. When did you become intense about journalism versus the criticism today that journalists are just going through the motion? What's the pixie dust that got you to the intensity of writing something like Punishing Putin? Well, I lived in Eastern Europe and started freelancing. I was really interested in doing that um, you know, from the get-go as soon as I got out of college. I went to Russia in the 90s, and that's when I kind of pivoted to business right. and finance because the story then was all about the economy. It was all about the transition, uh, Russia privatizing, a lot of the corruption that went around that. Right. Um, and that was the big story, and it was a really great training ground. It was really hard to be a reporter in Russia in the 1990s. I, I've got like 30 seconds. What, what am I going to do with Stephanie Baker in 30 seconds? <laughs> we're not talking football at Oberlin. No. No, we're not. What we'll do, punishing Putin. I can't, can't say enough about it. Rave reviews inside the global economic war uh, to bring down uh, Russia. Bill Browder, he has attended the show, calls this a riveting inside story of the unprecedented economic war to take down uh, Mr. Putin. It is to be polite. A work in progress. Stephanie Baker, thank you so much. Thanks uh, for, for having me. Out of Queen Victoria Street in London, uh, 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 each and every day in London for Bloomberg News and Bloomberg Opinion. Futures of 12, it is a perfect Friday. Stephanie Baker's not leaving until there's a cloud in the sky here in New York. It'll be there. Uh, the Cure. We have to play British music for Stephanie Baker. Good morning.
is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Are these stocks under-owned by institutional Wall Street? A lot of these companies talking about generative AI. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Investors just worried about the ongoing sales slump in China. And Michael Barr with news. A ship traveling through the Southern Red Sea has been attacked. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning across the nation on YouTube. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. That's a new digital way to get everything that Lisa Mateo does. The award-winning Lisa Mateo. Yeah, of course. Taking in trophies last night. She can earn Here. the trophies. She's not very good at keeping them. Left trophies. them at a bar in Penn Station. <laughs> They're out there somewhere, hey, Lisa, this morning. She's not the first morning. person to do that. Okay, I feel better. 
<laughs> Do you feel better right now? Yeah, Did you yeah. leave one, two, or five trophies? I left on the one. My our, my coworker Sebastian, he took the other two. And Thank I said, God I for will that. take care of this one and I lost Okay. It. <laughs> well we say good morning to Lisa Mateo, who's uh, uh, the achievement here of what we see at Bloomberg Radio awarded last night uh, in uh, New York City. The achievement of this market is critical. I really want to emphasize folks, this was a boring Friday about Wednesday. Right. And something started changing Paul Thursday. And Anna Wong and Estello wrote a blistering Bloomberg Economics note at 6 a.m. this morning, and they said all of a sudden the Fed meetings in play 50 or 25 basis points. September 18th, Tom, next week uh, we'll see here. We had uh, we were going to have some University of Michigan uh, data coming out at 10 a.m. Wall Street time, which Alex Steele and I will be reporting. And that's probably one of the last data points mm -hmm. that will really be, uh, I guess, in informative to this Federal Reserve as they think about rates going forward. From the Interactive Broker Studios, our Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. We got in a futures trying to keep those gains rolling along from yesterday. Right now we have S&P futures up about a tenth of a percent, 10 points at 5,612. Down futures up two tenths of a percent, 87 points at 41,232. And NASDAQ futures, well, down about a fraction, uh, down about four points at 19,445. We have the two year yield at 3.58%, down five basis points. The yield on the 10 year, 3.66%, and that's down one basis point. To commodities, we have spot gold higher, $2,573 an ounce. Uh, Brent crude, $72 a barrel. WTI crude, $69 a barrel. Shares of Boeing down 3%. Its factory workers started their first walkout 16 years. TD Cowan estimates that this strike could last 50 days, cut up to $3.5 billion from Boeing's cash flow. We shall see. Meanwhile, American Airlines flight attendants, they approved a contract that will raise wages as much as 20%, increase pay benefits by $4.2 billion over five years. American Airlines up about half a percent. And then sticking with airlines, some news from United. It selected Elon Musk. Starlink service for in-flight internet. United will begin testing it early next year. They're up about three-tenths of a percent. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Red and green on the screen. On Wall Street, it is 9.03. At the studios of CBS, it is 9.03 on a Friday, which means Margaret Brennan and Face the Nation have absolutely no clue where they're going to be Sunday morning for Face the Nation across the CBS a television network. That's the turmoil, the tumult of our British short election cycle. Joining us now, Margaret Brennan of Face the Nation. Of course, hear this effort Sunday afternoons at 2 on Bloomberg Radio. Margaret, good luck with this Sunday. How do you deem to approach our political maelstrom? Wow. Well, we have J.D. Vance, the junior Republican senator from Ohio, on to, I guess, explain some of the new tax policies and policies that Donald Trump wants to deliver on. Um, we, I was just reading through what he announced yesterday with this new no tax on overtime for workers once they hit 40 hours a week. And I've, I've got so many questions on how this is going to work. I'm really hoping he can explain that. Um, and I, I want to talk to him, of course, about so many other things um, that are circulating on right. the campaign trail. What are conventional Republicans doing? I mean, I guess the focus is on uh, Haley of the Carolinas, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. as a general statement within CBS reporting, what are conventional Republicans doing after the debate and the short step forward to November 5th? Great question, uh, because neither J.D. Vance nor Donald Trump are conventional Republicans. And, and I think we are seeing that in, in these policies, like the, the one I just mentioned, where it's it's very populist. It's not fiscal conservative, your dad's Republican Party, your grandfather's Republican Party. Um, and, and that question of does what crosses a line, you heard Vice President Harris make a play for some of those voters on that stage on debate night where she said explicitly in relation to January 6th, if that was a bridge too far for you, there's a place here in our campaign. They are trying to target and make a play for persuadable voters who, who don't identify as Democrats, but aren't comfortable with the remaking of the Republican Party in, in the J.D. Vance, um, Donald Trump uh, form. So. Okay. That, that's part of the game of inches here, <laughs> Tom, that's being played. Yeah. Margaret, it, 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 former President Trump says he's not inclined to do another debate. I don't think there's going to be another debate based upon his, some of his statements here. Mm -hmm. If you're Kamala Harris, 
how does that change maybe your media strategy? Do you sit down with the Margaret Brennans of the world? Do you sit down to maybe do town halls or even a mm -hmm. press conference, God forbid? What do you think the, the press, the media f strategy of Kamala Harris should be? Well, I mean, I'm not going to give advice. Obviously, I'm, I'm biased on this. I'll, I'll talk my own book and say, come on, face the nation yes. <laughs> anytime. But um, in, in terms of the question about the debate, I know the next date on the calendar for the two campaigns is October 1st on the CBS debate. That's the vice presidential yep. um, Waltz Vance matchup. And that may take on new resonance given the 78 year old challenger and the question of JD Vance, what he would do if he, he were to step into those shoes. Um, and we'll, we'll watch for that. I, I'm, I'm look, I'm, I'm cynical here. I, I don't believe that a no today means a no tomorrow. There are offers that I know of on the table from multiple networks who are in, including CBS. The CBS disclosed that yesterday, um, making offers for another debate. Um, so right. does this change? Possibly. Uh, could there right. be town halls? Possibly. Are we advantaged, Margaret? Paul brought this up earlier. Suddenly, it's almost a British election. It's mm -hmm. shocking how constrained it is. Do you suggest, with all the reporting at CBS, that we're advantaged by this compressed campaign? Uh, are we? Ad is there an advantage to it? Yeah, it's shorter. We're not, you know, we're, we're not running in February right. of 2024. It was, you know. Harris, Trump, it's new, it's Got short, it. let's go. Sure. I mean, I, I suppose in terms of the new, the shiny new factor, or not so new since she is the incumbent, but new to the top of the ticket, and there is a new, like, energy that came from that. The question is, right. like, does that take the vice president over the line in those mm -hmm. seven states that are neck and neck, and our CBS polling has shown they remain neck and neck. Um, in terms of Donald Trump, he, he is that known entity. It's hard to believe there's someone in America that doesn't have an opinion <laughs> about him at yeah. this point. Um, so, if, you know, is that a disadvantage to him? I don't know. Uh, his followers are pretty passionate. Uh, Margaret Brennan, thank you so much. Look forward to Face the Nation. See it on the CBS television network. Sunday morning, you can hear Margaret Brennan in Face the Nation. Uh, 2 p.m. Sunday in New York and Washington, D.C. and Bloomberg 92.9 FM in Boston. Face the Nation this Sunday at 2 on Bloomberg Radio. I have no idea in this election. I, I, you know, this is why it's great to have Margaret on. Yep. I guess I knew there was a vice presidential debate. Is it going to be the same, like no I, audience? I think you know, people so. might tune in here because... I don't know. You just don't, there's so much you don't know about uh, Kamala Harris. There's so much you don't know about this guy, Mr. Vance. And again, uh, former President Trump is 78 years old. So it's maybe something you got to pay attention yeah. to. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see. Uh, there, red and green on the screen. 20 minutes to the market opening. Michigan data at 10 o'clock as well. With our news in New York City, John Tucker. All right, Tom, Paul, and Lisa. For the first time in 16 years, factory workers have walked off the job at Boeing. Members of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, representing 33,000 Boeing employees across the West Coast, voted overwhelmingly to strike. Will there be another debate before President uh, Donald Trump and Vice President Harris? Bloomberg's Amy Morris tells us uh, we have kind of a pretty good indication right now it probably won't happen. Donald Trump ruled out another debate with an all-caps declaration on Truth Social. Quote, there will be no third debate. He insists he won their first debate, so he doesn't need to participate in another one. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke at a campaign event in Charlotte, North Carolina, shortly after Trump's statement. I believe we owe it to the voters to have another debate. It is not clear if the vice president was directly responding to Trump's post. Trump and Harris's running mates, Republican Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio and Democratic Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, are slated to hold their own debate on October 1st with CBS News. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer has arrived in Washington ahead of a meeting with President Biden. Sources telling Bloomberg the U.S. and U.K. are discussing allowing Kyiv to conduct strikes inside Russia using British cruise missiles backed by U.S. navigational data. Speaking yesterday, Russian President Putin warned against that move. This will be their direct participation, and this, of course, will significantly change the very essence, the very nature of the conflict. 
This will mean that NATO countries, the US and European countries are at war with Russia. Putin there through an interpreter. The discussion comes after the U.S. confirmed that Moscow has received shipments of ballistic missiles from Iran. And crews continue battling three wildfires east of Los Angeles in San Bernardino County. There's a red glow in the sky and a strong haze in the air as the flames continue to consume the area. Three fires have scorched more than 100,000 acres across Southern California. Elon Musk labels the Australian government fascist over proposed new laws to crack down on digital misinformation, in particular on social media websites. Under the proposed legislation, which has yet to pass Parliament, social media companies could be fined up to 5% of their annual revenue. And an update to a story that we told you about earlier. I took the liberty of calling NJ Transit at uh, Penn Station. They're lost and found. They tell me they have not found Lisa's award, oh, her no. major radio no. award. Thank Instead, you. I was told you have to fill out a form. I did that. Are you? You did. Yes, okay. I put in a claim. You put in a claim. I'm told it was a blue box. But it's 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 nine twelve. The package store doesn't open up till 11 a.m. Yeah, I know. You know, that's where she, she left it in counter. And, uh, there is the, the distinct store. possibility it could be found and labeled as a suspicious package, then taken up to Rodman's neck and exploded as a precaution. <laughs> precaution. <laughs> City safety as well. Yeah. Did you take, is there any evidence of this award? Or did this get Instagrammed by Oh, it's your, on Twitter. Your, it's on, it's on, on, on your, social media. Then it must be true. Yes, it's on the internet. <laughs> We will have to see. I'll never live it down. <laughs> the future's up 10, Dow future's up 109. The, the salient point this week has been a reaffirmation of double-digit earnings growth, which a lot of people disagree with. And then all of a sudden, folks, uh, we're back to a 25 or 50 beep cut. And, Paul, that's really been the, the fuel on the fire here the last day and a half. Yeah, yeah, I think Could so. we get I, 50 beep? I, you know, we don't we don't make our opinion on this, but I got to be sold on 50. Right, exactly. And so, we, you know, we, that's why we bring in the great guests here we have here, Tom. Great strategists, uh, fund managers uh, give us their thoughts on what this. they think is happening in these markets, including our, our next guest, Steve England. Uh, I mean, Cy that? sends a headline in right away. Cy Benson's driving every all of our intellect here. Traders price in 40% chance of half point Fed really? cut next okay. week. That's a big number, 40%, 4-0. Yeah, okay. I don't, you know. We'll be here, we'll be reporting. We'll, well, we'll be reporting at a two year yield. Let's report that right now in seven, seven, seven basis oh, points. I can't wait to see the Huge next mortgage moves. rating. 3.57, 10 year yield 3.65, <clears throat> 30-year bond well under 4% uh, as well. I look at the real yield down to new lows, 1.56%. On the 10 year inflation adjusted yield. On YouTube, Bloomberg surveillance.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We've got a mix of red and green on the screen, and this is after fresh U.S. data kept investors guessing on the size of an expected rate cut from the Federal Reserve. He had former Fed official Bill Dudley said there's, quote, a strong case for a 50 basis point cut next week. Uh, today, after uh, the markets open, we'll see a read on sentiment. Let's get over to futures now. Right now, NASDAQ futures down about a tenth of a percent, 18 points. Dow futures up two tenths of a percent, 111 points. S&P futures up a tenth of a percent, or 10 points. The two-year yield at 3.57 percent, down six basis points. A yield on the 10-year at 3.65 percent, and that's down two basis points. The currency is the dollar weaker. We have the Japanese yen up eight tenths of a percent at 146.62 against the dollar. The euro, British pound strong. We have Bitcoin down about half a percent at around 57,000. To earnings, we go Adobe down 8%. Its revenue forecast failed to reflect that AI uplift. And then you have Oracle. They're up 6%. Investors cheer their long-term sales targets. And finally, a boost to Uber's efforts to get more involved in the driverless vehicle area. We have the company. It's going to be the sole supplier of rides on Alphabet's Waymo cars in Austin and in Atlanta. For on-demand news 24 hours a day, subscribe to Bloomberg News Now wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Mateo. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Right now, uh, on short, short notice, uh, I thought he would be not in today after what the Red Sox did last night, four well, hits. And, you know, I thought about not coming in. You know, I mean, come on. If they lose today, it's 500 ball. What a, you know, it's like when they're in sixth place in the old American League in my ute. Well. It's like painful. We're like Brooklyn, you know, wait till next year. What happened, <laughs> seriously, what happened in the last two days, Anna Wong and Estella published this morning, that 50 beeps is actually in play? Why? Well, you know, the, we went into the blackout period with the Fed not saying one way or another. Fair. The markets convinced themselves based on data and just the the historical background of the Fed that 25 basis points was going to be it, and it still could be. Yesterday we had two stories out, one from Colby Smith in the Financial Times yeah, and one so from Nick, Tim Reyes in, in the Wall Street Journal. She quoted uh, everybody Journal. on surveillance. You see how she does yeah. that, Paul? Colby yeah. just listens to surveillance. Clarida, quote. That's his quote. That's so the way everybody rolls. gets their yeah. information. But those two suggested that uh, 50 basis points could be in play that it was a, a, a close call. Now, we all re remember how the Fed has used the Wall Street Journal as a pipeline to send messages to the markets. They haven't done it in a long time, but they did do it in June of 2022 with Nick Timreos uh, when they wanted to go to 75, when, when they got very bad economic data, yeah, okay. inflation data, the week before when they were in the blackout and couldn't tell. So. I don't think this was a message that they're going to do 50, but it is possible that somebody sent a message through them that uh, that it's on me. the table so that the markets are prepared. I mean, I have sat with McKee folks at Ben's Chili Bowl up on U Street in Washington, and he has pointed to me the smoke signals <laughs> coming up above the Eccles building. Has this story moved so fast in two days that now adults at the Fed have to say, stop it, put them in their place, Wednesday, September 18th at 2 p.m., 25 beeps? No, I think it works the other way. I think um, they, they either are just writing the obvious that it is a possibility, or somebody called them up and said, well, you know, we haven't ruled out uh, without going any further so that if they want to, if they, remember they got retail sales next week too. If that were to come in badly, then they maybe want to be more uh, dovish. Uh, but if they haven't completely decided yet, uh, then okay. they go into it with the markets at least not going to be shocked one way or another. Two adult questions and you're the expert. <laughs> Do they know where retail sales are right now? Is That's the big event next week. Yeah. And... Can they do the math on September 27, core PCE, and that's what the 50 basis point chat's about. They're getting out front of those two reports. No and yes. Uh, yes, they can do the math on PCE, and core PCE is, according to just about everybody who's now plugged in the data, going to come in at about one-tenth of a percent. So it's going to be very low, and that's what they want to see, which enables them to be more <clears throat> dovish if they want to be, because it 
counteracts the CPI, PPI data we got a little yeah. bit. Retail sales, they do not know, but they there are many alternative measures, including, and uh, this is a shameless plug, but <laughs> on the Bloomberg, the ECAN function ECAN. Uh, has a second measure, which is our our collection of retail sales data and it's showing that retail sales would be relatively what strong. What is Michael McDonough doing? Where, where are they? Are they in a bunker this below is, Home Depot? Yeah. And They're it, doing incredible with work. With all kinds of beakers of you know, scientific Paul, stuff. Paul, everybody's there. stealing I it. Yeah. I mean, it's like industry-wide. Everybody's I love using this world macroeconomic. It can go. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the Chicago right. Fed has their CART survey, which uh, is uh, also a retail sales survey. Uh, we haven't gotten this month's yet. We'll probably get it today or Monday. And it's in part based on the second measure data that we have. But uh, so there are alternative measures of retail sales that you can look at, and then it depends on how you weight them and what you think is most important. And remember, with retail sales, yep. it's always gasoline prices. Yeah, well, gasoline prices okay. coming down big time. Thank you very much. Uh, and John Tucker keeps us up to date on that. Michael, the sources you talk to, the economists you talk to, are they, are they comfortably in a soft landing camp, or are they concerned that this may be bumpier? Uh, going forward, well, I think they fastened their seatbelts, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because turbulence might be ahead. <laughs> but uh, in general, they're confident about uh, or feel at least sanguine about the idea of a soft landing. Uh, by all appearances, at the moment, that's where we are. The question is, do you go from there into trouble? Which is why I've urged Jay Powell to just come out and say, "Yeah, we had a soft landing," because you know, <clears throat> from here, <laughs> right, anything can happen. <laughs> it could be worse. Uh, the economy never really lands; it keeps keeps going. Right. And how about on, on the labor market? I mean, four point two, four point three. Is there that still feels foolish employment to a lot of folks. I think foolish. Yeah, foolish. I like it's a duke. When you're a duke, duke, they use that. That's, that's, that's foolish. foolish. That's that's foolish. Um, Are we okay right here? Oh, and can it even drift higher? Uh, we're okay. It could drift a little higher before the Fed gets overly concerned. They had at one point thought that we would get to four and a half. Yeah. And then a lot of people on Wall Street thought so too. <clears throat> we plumb the depths of how far you can go down with full employment uh, without right. causing problems. And nobody really knows for sure. Yeah. Are you going to be in Empower Stadium this weekend? Denver Broncos, Pittsburgh Steelers, you're going out to Denver? I, I am not. I am going to Yankee Stadium tomorrow. Oh, Are now you? we're talking. For Red Sox. Red Sox. Red Sox Yankees. This oh, is a wake, good. right? <laughs> we hope not. <laughs> we're hoping it's one last chance for that great chant that Boston and New York Mets fans have. Oh, would you like to say that now? No, so I'm not going to say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Uh, magical always in September when the Yankees Red Sox play. For those of you at Worldwide, it's uh, actually really still special even though the teams seem to be on <clears throat> it doesn't matter who's up or who's down pass. You, it, they just kind of split them I and mean, if you overlook any period of time well there's parity this just, year well i think it's just the competitive juices come out of both teams yes. both fan bases and i don't care who's yeah. good who's bad they play each other tough every single but time. to this season it used to be you know right now you're going who's going to win 100 games yeah we're trying to get to 90 games <laughs> i mean it's a it's a it's going to be a lot more like uh, football Anarag Ron is coming up. I actually did this this morning. I went to look at the new iPhones. Did you? Which, when I was in the Bentley, weren't up yet on okay. the different phone apps. No. But they are like late today or something. I think so, yeah. And I, I was into the uh, Verizon store on Lexington Avenue a couple of days ago, and the gentleman there says, you can start pre-order today, Tom. So yeah. make sure all the, I don't know what time all the minions is, on your plan, make sure they're Lisa's been distracted today. Yes. I mean, you know. <laughs> Did, I think you, she's, did your daughter? You I've know, got three did, of them to order. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's, um, I, and I talked to one of the phone vendors. I'm not going to say which one. We're not in the business of selling. They were incredibly polite, incredibly organized. Yeah. I mean, it's a racket. They know exactly what they're doing. Sure. It's no, no money down. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Add it up. And you know that's the way. Buy now, pay later. Is that what the kids do these yeah, days? That's what, oh, yeah, it's it's very much. We 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 knew that as the layaway plan. <clears throat> pay you know pay yes. later. Yep. And often. And so we need to get the markets open. We do this on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and you can be at 99.1 FM Washington, Bloomberg 11.30 New York, 92.9 FM in Boston. We say good morning on radio. When home at the office, YouTube subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo alongside Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney with your opening bell report. Now, we've had a pretty mixed bag of U.S. data this week. It's really been keeping investors guessing on the size of an expected rate cut from the Fed next week. This morning, we learned import prices fell in August as oil prices declined, imported airfare source seasonal declines. Traders pressing in a 40% chance of a half point cut. So let's see how we start things off on a Friday. Friday the 13th, none of that. Uh, S&P right now up about a tenth of a percent, six points, 5,602. We have the Dow up about a tenth of a percent, 41 points, 41,143. The Nasdaq, little change up about six points at 17,575. The two year yield, 3.57%, down six basis points. The yield on the 10 year, 3.65%, and that's down two basis points. We have spot gold higher, $2,577 an ounce. Brent crude, $72 a barrel. WTI crude, $69 a barrel. At the open, I want to check in with shares of Boeing right now. They are down about 1%. That is your opening bell report. Tom and Paul. <clears throat> Lisa, thanks so much. Okay, the way it works at Bloomberg, folks, is Mandeep Singh and Anurag Rana can't be in the same building at the same time. Of so course. Mandeep Singh's working from home. Yep. Legit. Because Anurag Rana darkened the door of our world headquarters here in New York, usually based out of Chicago, to say tech senior hub. tech analyst barely describes it. And I don't care about Adobe or Oracle. I'm looking at the phone service now. Good things come to those who wait. Demand is high right now. Please hang tight in this waiting room. When it's your turn to shop, we'll redirect, redirect you automatically. Does everybody need a new iPhone this morning? <laughs> this it happens a lot the first day when it goes to up sales. I've been waiting for the last few hours to, for them to open orders, which started at 8 a.m. Eastern time. And I honestly, in the 15 minutes I was able to get through, I'll pick it up next Friday. Right. I'm very happy about it. How much memory should we get in our phone? I mean, you're a pro. You're downloading I, secret files and all that. Yeah. <laughs> How no, much I, in our I, iPhone 16? I, I, I go with the basic because I have the premium iCloud pr pr plan, so it doesn't matter to me. So what am I getting again? Uh, the 16 Pro. Okay, thank you. So Anurag, he's got a day job being like tech guru for Bloomberg Intelligence. Oh, we don't but care. a side job <laughs> is my personal iPhone shopper. I just give my credit card and he goes and So you it have the iCloud, so you don't have to spend up for all that RAM. Yeah. Like, if I want to get the complete season of Slow Horses on there, all four seasons, I'm not going to use up all the RAM on the phone? No, you, you, I, I have never, I, in the last 15 years, I've never seen uh, any storage issues. You go with the basic model, it's not a problem, but you want to get the iCloud premium plan so that you, you're, oh. not, you're not looking at things. Uh, Lisa, do you have the iCloud Would you like to wait? No, this? but here's the thing. I'm paying these extra $1.99 a month, $2.99 a month for all this extra, extra storage. Yeah. Did I do it the wrong way? Am I, was I supposed to go your way? <laughs> See, <laughs> Am I wrong? See? No, no, he's my personal iPhone that shopper. I need so <laughs> when you really buy a I don't know, a Rolls Royce, you don't worry about like, you know, the price of oil and these things. So I really don't like you need to get the the premium plans for these things to just work seamlessly. You don't want any headache, you don't want any time anything not syncing right. properly. So sum up this oh intelligent gosh. conversation. This is the most important conversation we've had today. Yeah with the phrase AI. Where does this madness fit in to your day job, the future of this AI world? So one of the things that we have said that when you look at Apple, it has probably the most valuable distribution arm of any kind of device at this point because it's usually very rich people who would own this particular uh, product. Over the next two years, we will see a lot of AI applications come in, and you would need a phone like an iPhone 16 for those to run. You, you may not want to upgrade this year, maybe you will upgrade it next year, but within the next two years, we will see a lot of phones being refreshed. We think it's a little more biased towards next year because the phone model is going to be a lot different than this one, which is very much like the last year's model, but the next two years are really good for this entire um, iPhone uh, family. So. Talk to us about what's going on. If I want to get exposure to AI, I mean, Tom's owned NVIDIA since day one, so he's, he's fine. But for the rest of us, we want to get exposure to AI in the software space. Because I like the software space. I like the recurring revenue that you've always taught us about. Where do I go in software for AI exposure? You know, we think it is still the biggest cloud players because 
you are not going to see companies do a lot of this in-house. They will be using either Microsoft OpenAI relationship, Amazon Anthropic relationship, Oracle's also benefit, benefiting because it's getting the bypass of all of these companies. Google has Google and Gemini. So there is all of these big companies. And I mean, as much as you dislike, but big, these big companies are only gonna get bigger over the next five years, much bigger. How about this? I guess one of the issues with AI was just come into the marketplace maybe over the last three to six months is, okay, we've got through the euphoria of people spending money on AI and getting exposure to AI, and that drove NVIDIA and drove a lot of other companies. Now the discussion has become, wait, 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 what's my return on this investment again? What's the, how do you, how's that, what's that discussion go like? So when you look at somebody like an NVIDIA, they are, um, all these cloud players are buying chips from them. Something over like 40% of the chips are bought by the cloud providers. The <clears throat> cloud providers are then going to companies, they're going to healthcare right. companies, banks, and saying, we'll help you develop an AI chatbot, an AI application that would help you drive productivity. Right. Barclays, with a brilliant report, just like the serious work you're doing at Bloomberg Intelligence, on the electrical usage, the electricity utility build out. To make a long story short, folks, in three cups of coffee, it's gonna be at least 9% of the nation's electricity. A sentence from Barclays. Northern Virginia, good morning, 99.1 FM, which currently accounts for over 20% of US data center capacity. Can we build out the electrical need responsibly and appropriately without Lisa Mateo's utility bill going to the moon? I think that is going to be the single most important thing, the capacity to run a lot of these AI applications. My colleague Omid just did a very brilliant uh, podcast yeah. on tech disruptors um, for Schneider Electric CEO. Highly recommend people listening to it. It was phenomenal in the way the world's energy needs or electric needs, re electrification is improving and how much they are doing to, to yeah, solve a lot of this problem. Yeah, we're getting brownouts in Texas. Well, the Texas has got their wacko utility uh, structure. I mean, when, when John Tucker logs on in the Lincoln Tunnel, <laughs> Staten Island dims. <laughs> Are we ready for this, Santa Rock? I think I think money will need to be spent at a federal level to help this cause because transmission lines are not there. The electricity generation needs to be there. Nobody wait, wants wait, to build wait, wait. nuclear Senator, plants. Senator Warren of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and a few other Republicans are going to say, you guys are making all the money. You build the capacity. Why shouldn't Microsoft and their brethren build out the electrical capacity? Bill gets very big on nuclear plants. If they allow him, I, I am sure he won't have a problem building one, but you know, the, the, the country is not ready to build nuclear plants anywhere. And you mentioned this, Tom, it's a great topic here about a derivative topic about AI and, and the energy demand. Bloomberg Intelligence has a 40 page deep dive, AI driven energy demand outlook, solar, gas, and batteries race to power AI revolution. What's the sum of that, Anarok? Wow. It's, the, 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 see, at the end of the day, that remains one of the biggest bottlenecks for us, both the GPU shortage as well as electricity <coughs> and power. And I think that's, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. I go back 2008, nine, everybody's talking about how the, the world is gonna run out of oil and everything. In the next two years, the US capitalists figured out how to do fracking. I'm very confident we will figure something out in the next three to five years that's right. gonna help us with this shortage in electricity. Okay, I'm, can you call John Legere up and figure out what to do here? I, I gotta order, you know, vet bill had a tantrum last night. Almost bit kennel fee. I know. Vet bill needs the new 16 Pro Max, you know. <laughs> Well, you're getting yours and a watch next week, right? Yeah. So you're doing your no, total. Well, well, which watch you get? The 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 the, the pro with the, the uh, what is the Ultra Two, uh, the black with the the titanium. Does the it black tell time shiny though? one. Does it even tell time? I actually have never used one of those watches, but I, this is the first time I'm going to experiment with the, the bigger one. Jesus, I don't know. Okay. What you? Do? I mean, I you don't do Omega single watch. best. I'm fine. I don't need I, I, How do you respond, Anurag Rana? to the gloom, the breath of gloom right now on AI. I it's think healthy, right? It is always healthy. We went through the same thing in the internet bubble. When we, we had the 2000 crash, right. and after that three years, nothing happened. But right. internet is still so much bigger. So we're gonna go through massive amounts of ups and downs in the stocks going moving up okay. and down. But I think the build out is real. The market lifted when Anurag talks. Course. It's great. Yeah, it's it's Anurag Rana with us with Bloomberg Intelligence. For those in the terminal, go to Bloomberg Intelligence for all, not only that, but the, the podcast for Schneider. 
uh, as well. I'll try to look at the Schneider podcast and get that out on Twitter and LinkedIn if I can. Green on the screen on a Friday. I, on Wednesday at 10 a.m., Paul, I had no idea we would be at this point on Friday. No, no. And then we've got we, a two-day moonshot. Yeah, and then we've got the Fed, I mean, you know, next week here. So um, yeah. we're going to hear from the Fed. We'll hear some color, and the question is 25 or 50, and right. then we go on. I'm going to suggest right now uh, the market, uh, Dow up 115 points, outperforming where futures were an hour ago. Uh, BitDog flat, 58,000, rounded up. And the yield, it's coming a little bit, but I'm sorry, 3.57% two-year yield speaks to this tension as the Fed decides next Wednesday. With our news in New York City, John Tucker. All right, Tom, Paul, Lisa, machinists at Boeing who voted to go on strike. In a news conference after the vote, the union president, John Holden, revealed the results. Our members rejected the contract by 94.6%, and they voted to strike by 96%. This is the first walkout of Boeing since 2008. It's another setback for the aircraft maker whose reputation and finances have been battered recently. Kamala Harris making a pitch to swing state voters as she hits back on the campaign trail. I believe we owe it to the voters to have another debate. Well, the vice president kicking off her post-debate blitz in Charlotte, North Carolina. Harris will be back in Pennsylvania today for two more back-to-back -back rallies. The Justice Department preparing criminal charges in connection with an Iranian hack that targeted Donald Trump's presidential campaign. Let's get more from Washington and Bloomberg's Steve Podisk. The prospect of criminal charges comes as the Justice Department has raised alarms about aggressive efforts by countries, including Russia and Iran, to meddle in the presidential election. It was not immediately clear when the charges might be announced. Assistant Attorney General Matthew Olson, the Justice Department's top national security official, said in a speech Thursday Iran is making a greater effort to influence this year's election than it has in prior election cycles and that Iranian activity is growing increasingly aggressive as this election nears. In Washington, Steve Potusk, Bloomberg Radio. Elon Musk has labeled the Australian government fascists over proposed new laws to crack down on digital misinformation, in particular on social media websites. Under the proposed legislation, social media companies could be fined up to 5% of their annual revenue if they fail to take steps to manage the risks that misinformation and disinformation on digital communications platforms poses in Australia. And China going to raise the retirement age, a move likely to slow a decline in the labor force, but anger workers already wrestling with a slowing economy. Men's retirement age will increase from 60 to 63 while women's will rise from 50 and 55 to 55 and 58. This change will take place over 15 years. China, of course, the world's second largest economy behind the U.S. The U.K.'s police and crime minister, Dame Diana Johnson, delivered a speech to the S Police Superintendents Association conference. She warned of an epidemic of antisocial behavior, theft, and shoplifting that the Labour government had inherited from the Conservatives. At that same police conference, she had her purse stolen. Global News, 24 hours a day, whenever you want it, with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker. This is Bloomberg. Paul, Lisa, Tom. John, thanks so much. Big money football here. UConn traveling to Duke. Sure. The Fayetteville Observer has it. It was an agreement made in 2019. UConn gets a $300,000 guarantee from Duke for playing this weekend. Yeah, why not? So that's like you're the away team. Yep. Come and they down. negotiate, a, you know, it could be more, but is yep. that how it works? I think so, yeah. For a lot of these, uh, you know, out-of-conference games, particularly the ones that maybe the bigger conference team, in this case Duke, uh, you know, want to get a little bit of a tune-up game. I'll be polite and call it that. Before with, UNC, which yep, is the exactly. only game that matters. But how about Duke, UConn, and basketball? That's what I'm looking forward to. Hopefully that would be, be good. That would be a bigger guarantee. Year. Yeah, that would be big. I don't know who's guaranteeing who there. That's how good UConn We will is. see. Dow up 100 early. points. SB up 17 at points. A little nice. You know, good feel to the tape right now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning. And now a look at some of the local headlines making news in the tri-state area. New
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. The world's biggest bond market revived. Thoughts of a half-point rate cut by the Fed next week, sparking the slide in Treasury yields, gains in stock swap traders currently pricing 40% chance of a 50 basis point reduction. So let's get to it. They have the two-year yield 3.57%, down six basis points. The yield on the 10-year 3.66%, and that's down one basis point. We have the Nasdaq up three tenths of percent, the Dow up four tenths of percent, and the S&P 500 up three tenths of percent. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. Busy, busy 15 minutes here to get to the 10 o'clock hour in the Michigan uh, statistics. So I'm going to get right to it. David Samra joins us right now. And this is a really, really important conversation for everybody. 120% in U.S. equities going international hasn't worked since time began, but is now the time. With artisan international value, uh, David Samra. What's changed in the last six months? in this, oh, the last decade's been painful, now is the time for international. What's a change agent right now? Well, I don't think there is a real change agent. I think that any long-term investment strategy requires discipline uh, and it requires, at least for us in the way that we approach it, an ability to identify securities that are mispriced. And I know that things haven't worked over the last decade or so for many uh, international investors, but if you look at our performance you know, over the last 22 years since we've been in this business, we've actually been, uh, and we're not alone in this, able to outperform the S&P 500, which is pretty remarkable <coughs> if you consider Paul. that outside the U.S. you don't have right. Google, you don't have uh, Apple, right. you don't have any of these big platform businesses. They yeah. just simply don't exist outside the Paul, United States. Paul, he's underselling it. Three-year, 93rd percentile. Five-year, 92nd percentile. Yeah, they're okay. They're, they're, they're doing, they're doing right. okay. Continue. Yep. Um, Japan. This is as fascinating to me because when I started my career in the mid-'80s, Japan was the bomb. You had to go to Japan. You had to do a tour of duty there. You had to have a, a marketplace there. And then it went dormant for a generation. Why are Warren Buffett, why are people like you talking about Japan over the last couple of years? Well, the corporate governance system in Japan has changed dramatically. Historically, it's been a backwater for corporate governance where, you know, the board of directors was the chairman and the CEO were the same person and all the other members of the board were management who owed their jobs to the chairman and CEO. And cross shareholdings made it very difficult for others to penetrate that system, so outside investors had very little influence. That system is changing. It was st uh, started by uh, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and that's continuing today. Even, you know, one of the equities that we own, Seven and I, is in the midst of receiving a takeover offer from a large Canadian company. You know, yeah. this hasn't been seen before. One of their huge holdings, and this, I guess, goes to Mr. Buffet and all, is insurance, and especially insurance. Tell us about the persistency of cash flows. I believe Mr. Buffet loaded up on Chubb, a local story in that, but tell us about Arch Capital Group and your focus on insurance. Arch Capital is an amazing company, and we bought the stock uh, way back in 2004 when it was capitalized with a billion dollars. Today, the company has a book value of $13 billion and bought back about 40% of the shares outstanding. And that really comes down to discipline. You know, uh, underwriting <coughs> discipline is uh, very yeah. important in that industry. And Buffett's organization, Berkshire Hathaway, symbolizes that. And so does Arch Capital. And that's how you right. create value. David Harrow, obviously a great international investor, really challenging times. And my former Swiss. boss. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> but, but you're not a Packers fan. I am not a Packers fan. Okay, thank God for that. <laughs> Okay, but anyways, weaned under David Harrow, who I adore, and he was a total class act as Credit Suisse blew up. But all of a sudden, I got, is it Orchell? What would Francine say? Orchell. Orchell. Yes, Orchell. she corrected us yesterday. Unit credit. And, oh, Carol Masser darkened the door. We'll get to Carol in a moment. <laughs> Unit credit and Commerce Bank. Finally, is it a Samra Harrow moment for European <laughs> Bank? Finally, I say. Well, the big moment was actually Comb Kelleher. Yep who's the chairman of UBS, who swooped in over a weekend, a wintry weekend in March, and took over Credit Suisse at a handout 
price. That was the big moment that created an enormous amount of value, and anybody involved in UBS was able to, to profit handsomely from that. Where's UBS in five years, and where is Swiss banking in five years? Well, I think UBS today is no longer undervalued. You know, uh, the, the value that was created by that transaction is now reflected in the share price. And so uh, we think that it'll grow somewhere between 5 and 10 percent per year. Right. Over the, but it's not, you're not going to knock it out of the park okay. at UBS at this price. I got one more question because Master's here and people are looking at their watches. <laughs> they're, going, they're going like this. David, got a blowout David waiting. Sama, you don't own Deutsche Bank or it's I not don't. visible. I don't. Banks are terrible businesses. When, when is Deutsche Bank going to get their act together? I was shocked how small it is versus yep. BMP Paribas. Yeah, when no. Do, when does DBK get their act together? Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it does. It's just too levered. It operates in tough businesses. It doesn't have a core retail franchise or a core wealth management franchise that can generate superior capital generation right. and that's what it comes down to with banking the Milwaukee Brewers I mean they stole your manager what was that about <laughs> would Derek Jeter look good managing well, the Milwaukee Brewers you know I grew up in Boston right so I'm a Red Sox fan yes. I worked at Fenway Park <laughs> yes you know there are 11 games out this year what'd you do at Fenway Oh, I uh, I made pizza. I sold hot dogs. Oh, a real yeah, job. Yeah, I had a real job there. Yeah, yeah <laughs> okay. it was fantastic. What, go, but I don't pay that much attention anymore <clears throat> because I've discovered fishing, which is way more fun than okay. sitting in front of the TV. Did you sit there like me as a kid? You know, Pumpsy Green was out in center field watching the old fat guy do the two Narragansett lager beers, <laughs> open them with his thumbs, and pour them at the same time. Oh, loved it. What loved a gift. It. Mrs. Yawkey used to sit up there and go like this. That's a George challenge. Scott was, you know, one of my favorite players. El Tiante, yes. just yeah. all beautiful. Mr. Tiante. El Tiante. And, and he's, he's been great. He was, Louis he was been great. terrific. And Fred Lynn with the new double knees. David Sammer, Freddie don't Lynn. be a stranger. Uh, yes. With Artisan Partners Thank you. Milwaukee. Thank you both. With, great to have you in here. We digress. You know, people called up, and I said, I really don't have the space. I got David Samra. <laughs> she said, Jeter. I said, I got to take it. It's the only Yankee Red Sox fans like Carol Massa, the honor of speaking to the one of the Yankees yesterday. Can I just say, what a super nice guy. Like, yeah. you know, we, you guys talk to athletes, um, we all do, um, but this guy, just super, super nice from the minute he walked in, curious about our world, just had questions for us, and we could kind of go anywhere. I have to tell you, he has no interest, though, at least he says at this point, in owning another, in owning an MLB team. Although he said, never say never, you never know. Well, he down did the, the Miami road. thing, right? Yeah. And, and it was, I interviewed him with a leading creditor son. Something. And it, it, it was a struggle, right? Well, yeah. And, you know, the thing is, he said he's got four kids, I think, under the age of seven. He said, yeah. he's got a bunch of little critters right now. And he said that's his focus right now. And so that is what his attention is. Having said that, he was with the founder of Untuck It, Chris uh, Riccobono, and very interesting, they're doing this new athletic wear uh, brand. He's very involved. It's not just, here's some money, figure it out. He said kind of no initially. He had to be kind of wooed, if you will. Uh, and he's in on this. So. so, I mean, I thought you guys were really interesting talking to him about, they're going into a competitive business. I mean, this athletic athleisure wear i'm not sure kind of how they really want to position it you got the nikes of the world yep. and under armors of the world i guess they're just looking for their little slice of that big Rome, huge business. Viore, they're yep. looking for a slice it's a massive market it's yep. expected to i think nearly double like in the next you know few years so listen i was doing the interview in yoga pants that were pilling <laughs> yeah. and he said our, our stuff doesn't pill we don't do i have never done an interview <laughs> rich take a note i've Wait. never done an interview in yoga pants okay but if you do please let us know <laughs> <laughs> no but having said that you know i think they think about the celebrity aspect of it they've got misty copeland getting involved with the female side of the yep. business you know you need people to be wearing it and that's what gets other consumers on board so yeah i mean your yeah. family daughters wife they wear a fair amount of, right, athletic wear. Are you kidding me? The packages, <laughs> three packages came in yesterday. Yeah. I don't even know where this stuff comes from. Um, Mrs. King stopped me, and she was watching yesterday the first Beetlejuice. I know. Just to get up to speed. I haven't seen and the movie I was, yet. Paul, jump in here. I, I mean, 44 million, I mean, this is like a post-Labor Day shock. It is. I mean, for um, it, the first one did great, and now yep. we've got the, the, the success, successor 
you're going to be speaking with the screenwriter of it, right? Today? We have the screenwriters. Yep, absolutely. I think what's interesting is you bring back, I don't know whether it's nostalgia or something, right? You bring back a group of actors. We've seen this movie before. We're mm-hmm. curious about, it's been a while since the original one. Michael Keaton. Right? Yeah, and so to see some success, because we know the box office has been struggling in, in a big, big way. Um, yeah, kind of interesting stuff. Tell me about Bloomberg Business Week. I mean, it's on fire right now. I mean, you know, they had the Trump Thank interview. You. They drink wine. And, and all that. Fun. College. We have a whiskey guess so, of course you do <laughs> although no samples today how come rich how come we don't have a whiskey guess yes, is it too exactly. early in the morning well it's like 9 56 in the morning <laughs> right. um okay. no it's fun it's a good good snapshot of our world just like you guys do college football players learn an ugly truth about getting paid that's a lead right now for bloomberg business week yeah we're gonna tap into that right like uh we feel like the floodgates have opened okay. up but you know you wonder what it all means carol tim bloomberg business week in the afternoons we're uh Really going to look forward to that. I need to frame out uh, th- this this end of the weekend because it's totally different than where I thought we would be Wednesday. Right. We have a legitimate and Anna Wong head out. Not her story at 6 a.m. this morning, but like 14 hours ago, whatever. She had a story saying, look, the indecision here of 25 or 50 beeps is untenable. And she literally said on Monday they will clarify and, and I thought Mike McKee right. was great on that, you know, through the media, whatever. Carol Mass will get a phone call from Mr. Powell, whatever. Yep. But they got to clarify what's going on. This is not a normal Fed process. In this meeting, the Fed decides Wednesday, September 18th, is not normal, Paul. But you guys will be on tap. Michael McKee will be down uh, in Washington, D.C. We'll send him down on the Acela train bright and early. Yeah. Um, but again, I think people want to get a sense of if you do go to 50 or if you don't, if you, even if you stay at 25, what's really your okay. view of this economy? Are you on top of this soft landing approach here or could it get a little bumpy when we touch down? Okay. Uh, I think people are looking for some rhetoric that will kind of guide you that way. Paul, nobody cares. I just got up on the T-Mobile website oh, boy. for the phone. Yep. Do I need one terabyte of storage? Anarag, I think, said no. Well, I mean, he's, Why not? he's a big That's cloud guy. He's a big cloud guy. He puts it all up there in the cloud. But he's tech savvy. I'm not sure, you know, where you want to go, Tom. It took pay monthly, it says. Yeah. Oh, what a shot. Pay in full. Look of at course. the price of the thing. What is it? Uh, just a, This is just a basic phone. Fifteen hundred dollars? No, it's not. Is with it? a one ter- I think with a one terabyte oh, build. Here we go. All right. That's All right. a lot of money. But maybe I'll get something on a trade in. I think I get a trade, trade in. in. I looked up the price, the okay. phone I have. Yeah, I think um, they're going to give me like fifteen bucks or something for mine. That's, no, that's Tucker. No, Tucker. <laughs> they're going to pay him. <laughs> just <laughs> just, so just go away. Just throw he away. It. It's been a wonderful, wonderful week. Uh, we thank all of you, all of you for. Uh, all the feedback we're getting here. Let me frame it out again, our distribution. In the car, Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, in the corridor from 991 Washington up to Bloomberg 1130 in New York. And good morning, 929 FM in Boston. A particular good morning to Catherine Kaminsky at Alpha Simplex, who was really brilliant on the markets earlier. Emily Rowland at John Hancock as well. Across this nation, when you get to the office, to the living room, whatever, YouTube, and YouTube on uh, Bloomberg Podcast. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. The Dow, up 240 Alex Steel points. 